Bird, 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 bird. Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. It is the 5th of December. Sitting in the kennel Sunday morning like so many Sunday mornings, getting these put together, getting ready to send you another episode out here. I always start off with thanking my Patreon patrons. I got to tell you, last week's Zoom Room, we do two of them a month for P- Patreon patrons. And you sometimes hear some stories that you will never hear. But this one we had a, a guest on, Jonathan Tremblay from Walton's. And it was kind of like how to make your own sausage, game me, grind, uh, f- temperature. I mean, it was very informative. We're going to have Jonathan come on again and, uh, and, and do all things cooking and all things meat preparation. Because I love the preparation of the game as much as I like the game of game. And uh, that was it was a great Zoom, but it lasted. Jonathan had to get off at about you know one at, at about an hour and a half, and then it lasted till midnight, four hours. We we got into some weeds, man. We got into some weeds, but anyway, not weed. We got into the weeds on conversations, but anyway, it's fun. People come up with questions and topics, and new people like, hey, I'm getting into this, and you got all these other people. It's not just me. It's a it's a big group of people that. Love to share information and, and, and know something about dogs. So that's where I'd go on a Thursday night if I were you, but you'd have to join Patreon to do that. And if you did join Patreon, you'd always get a discount on Pike Gear, my title sponsor. That's right. And they've got a holiday say, sale going on right now. All you got to do is go to Pike Gear and get on their email list. And they are running a bunch of specials between now and Christmas, which so many people do. I mean, The Upland Institute is running a special until December 10th. And I'll tell you what, last week I announced that, and on Monday, all I was doing was sending promo codes out to people who, and the only way you can get the deal on the Upland Institute is to go to the Upland Institute, hit the contact page, and ask me, just say, hey, Ron, would love to get the code for... uh, Upland Institute's cyber, we call it the cyber sale, but it lasts till December 10th. So you still got five days to do that if you want to. And we'll do a little reminder probably on Wednesday with Instagram. But anyway, that's how you, that's how you get things. All of my sponsors want you to go to their website. I know it's data collection and they're going to send you emails. You don't have to read them. You can swipe them. But if you want a deal on Pike Gear, and I would tell you right now, Brent just dropped off this the Tongas pullover, and they got it now in solid orange. Solid orange. I love that. It, it is like this time of year right now, that's all I need to wear. And you know what? Even those people are still out there in the trees doing a little muzzleloader hunting or bow hunting, they're going to see me coming. I think he could make one of these for dogs. It would be a hit. But the only way you're going to get the sales on Pike Gear is to go there and give them your email address, and they will get notifications of all the sales coming up from now till I don't know. Maybe December 24th. That'd be kind of, I wouldn't wait that long. Same thing with, you know, Upland Institute. You can't wait that long. If you want to save for the first time and only time, if you want to save on the Upland Institute, you got to go to the website, be a better trainer. The way to be a better trainer is to go to school and learn something. The way to go to school is go to the Upland Institute. Go look at the commercials, look at the previews, look at the, the course commercials. You'll see what it's all about. And you know what? Make Gift yourself the gift of being a better trainer. There. All you got to do is go to the website, fill out the contact information, and I'll get a hold of you personally. That's right. I do. I write every one of them back personally. It's, it was a lot of work last week. Onyx, know where you stand, know where you've been, set a pin. Uh, Onyx is getting to be like one of them one-word things like Garmin. Right, it's just like everybody. You say Onyx, everybody knows what it is. I don't know how else to describe it except the handiest tool you can have. Whether you're hunting, fishing, hiking, uh, probably come in handy if you're a skateboarder. Maybe I don't know. Hard to say. And uh, we're gonna I've got a really cool thing coming up with Onyx, but can't tell you about it till January. That's right. CZ USA, 
you know, right now, right in negotiation, CZ USA has sent me all their requests for metrics and and episodes and everything, and I'm sure CZ will be back on next year just like they are, just like Onyx, just like Boss Shot Shells. You can't find – you could f- no, you can't. You can't. I don't think you can find as good a gun for the money as you can't a CZ. You, I, don't, I really don't think you can. And the same thing with Boss Shot Shells. I guarantee you can't find a better shell for the money. Absolutely, hands down, that one. You know, I could be a little off on the CZ. But I can tell you where I'm not off, boss shot shells. You will not get better non-tox ammunition for the money. Look at some of the prices of the other stuff. It is, everyone's like, oh, the prices went up. Everybody's prices went up. Did you notice gas went up? Everything went up. But they kept it to a minimum. You cannot find a better shot shell non-tox than a boss for the money. That is a statement. That is... If God himself came down and said, Ron, what is the best price point quality shot shell? I'd only have one word, boss. Or I'd be looking at God and saying, boss, it's boss. And then he'd probably be mad that they took his name. Maybe, who knows? It's hard to say. Walton says everything but the meat. And we had a really good history of Walton's. Walton's was, I didn't realize this, Walton's was a commercial restaurant supply company. Then they did very little stuff to the to the, you know, Joe 12 gauge and Jane 12 gauge, you know, and now they are really on the forefront and there. I think, I think you and me, the listeners are now 20% of Walton's business because we're all kind of, we're all kind of turning into foodies. And if you've turned into a foodie or if you're getting kind of foodie curious, go to Walton's and get their catalog. The catalog it's, it's dangerous. That's all I'm telling you. Get the Walton's catalog, and you're going to find stuff you didn't know you needed. You know, really. And uh, you get to meet. They got everything else. Purina, there's nothing I could say about Purina that I haven't said before. So that is going to be the shortest Purina commercial ever. It's the number one food of all sporting dogs. I think of all dogs in this country. So, I mean, you want to be an outlier? Be an outlier. Gunner Kennels and Gunner Food Crates, again, the best. There is nothing made better. I don't know. That's plenty enough, right? Gunner kennels and gunner food crates. Name me, just like Boss Shot Shells, name me a kennel company that makes a kennel as good as that that's guaranteed for life. And then, you know what? I'll solicit them, and I'd like them to be my sponsor. But for now and forever, it's gunner kennels. Garmin, you don't, same thing. How do you get something better when it's, when it's already the best, right? Garmin's been around forever. You know, obviously for the few of you who are brand new to this world, and you might not know it, but Garmin took over Tritronics years ago. Tritronics was the number one dog training electronics in the world. And then they merged with Garmin, the number one navigation company in the world. You know, don't lose your, just, it's the number one tool for canine training and navigation, simply simply put. Canine Athlete's the number one supplement you can get for your dog. I, you know what, I took Bravo, I, I kind of put, I put Bravo on a diet. Everybody knows Bravo, my 12-year-old Bracco. Big, lumbering beast that started out at 80 pounds, probably got darn near to 95 pounds last summer. Put him on a diet and put him on new dog. Took him pheasant hunting last week. And I took him because the fella didn't invite me, which is pretty next week's episode, Ryan. He said, yeah, definitely bring a dog. I just, I've only got a seven-month-old dog, so we, yeah, we need some experience. I'm like, Bravo, do you have it in you? And Bravo stepped up to the plate. Um, I think we hunted about two and a half hours, three hours, just, you know, just like a morning hunt. And, uh, and he, was, he was good to go. Now, beautiful temperatures and everything, but you know what? I guarantee you new dog will make a new dog out of your old dog. I wish they could make something for me to make me a new human. That'd be great. W Hunting Supply got two emails last week from people who literally listened to what I said, went to W, bought something, had a question, and the customer service department in both cases was so blatantly fantastic, so blatantly fantastic that they felt compelled to write me a letter, and I forwarded those emails over to Justin and, or Jason and Buddy, 
And uh, I, I, it's like that's what they're talking about. You, you've got to buy some gear for your dog. Go to a company whose service is because prices is prices is prices. Okay, you can get specials and deals, but you're 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 paying what you're paying for. That's not the issue. Service these days is the issue, and that's what you get from W. Now, if you want something that's got everything and can hold everything, like your canine athlete, your Garmin, your bag of Purina, any you know your Boss shot shells, your CZ shotgun, your Pike gear, then you what you need is the deck drawer system. That is, you know, you've been hearing me kind of talk about it for about a month, and I've talked about it before, and I'm going to have Kevin on pretty soon uh, from Deck. He's a passionate bird hunter. Um, glad to have deck drawer system not just on the podcast in my truck and it's been in my truck this is one of those rare items when when i got a hold of them a year and a half ago and they, they're like yeah they like to put i get a lot of things for free let's be honest okay and i got my deck drawer system for free no obligation they were not a sponsor they wanted to put it in you know and where it was going to be used and you know talked about a little bit and shown off you know it, people see me and see the truck they see the deck storage system but I'm telling you, running that thing down, I live on a sand washboard road, so it, every day this thing gets shook up. I go out west, I go wherever I go, I'm off-roading. I don't know anything else that could have stayed in the back of this truck and not one loose bolt, not one loose screw. You know, if W's got the best, the absolute best service, deck drawer system's got to have the best engineers you will once you have it, you'll you'll wonder why it doesn't come stock with a pickup truck. Seriously, they, they might all think about that. Maybe be great if Ford had like the Hunting Dog Podcast. You know how they used to have the King Ranch, right? You know, named after that place in you know in Texas. They should have the HDP edition, and it comes with everything. It comes with the deck drawer system. It comes with the comes with pike gear, comes with onyx and right on your dashboard. They'd give you a CZ shotgun, a case of shells from Boss. They'd give you all the spices from Walton's. You'd get a, a, a month's supply of Purina. You'd strap your gunner kennels to the top of it. You'd, your Garmin would be the collars in your deck drawer system for your dogs. Everything. Everything would be in that, deck, uh, in that Ford. Let's call it the Ford HD. Come on, somebody's got to work for Ford. This could be the hit. This could be a hit. Ford offers the HDP edition, and it just comes right off the lot with everything you need. Could you imagine that? Probably only throw about 50 bucks a month into your payment. Um, anyway, did you get your order, your, your subscription for Shooting Sportsman Magazine? Because if you didn't, and you're a patron, go to Shooting Sportsman Magazine. Go, to the, go into past post. You can get it your first year subscription. It's, it, they're darn near giving it to you. Okay, and if you can't find it, write me. If you're not a patron, I'm sorry. You, I hope you still get Shooting Sports Magazine, but you won't get it as cheap as you would any other way. Yeah. Hey, something I never, ever, ever, ever have talked about. My daughter Jessie. My daughter Jessie. She has an Instagram account, and a lot of you, a lot of you know because we kind of Instagram message a lot. Um, my Instagram is very active, very interactive now, and that's because of her. She's taken it over as, as a, a little bit of a part-time job, being a, a half-time stay-at-home mom, um, and she's working on, her and my other daughter are working on some uh, a store for HTP products. That's going to be coming up in the new year. Anyway, Jesse is a nutritionist. A, a master's a master, she has a master's degree in nutrition, and she works for hospitals, she works for YMCA, she works for the Boy Scout camp, designing meals, talking about health, tying in meals to some people with health problems. Anyway, Jesse started a podcast. So if you're a bit of a foodie, you know, and you really want to get some cool stuff, Jesse's podcast is called The Intuitive Kitchen. Jesse Holden, check it out. And if you are not the foodie in the family, and let's say your partner's the foodie in the family, Tell them about the Intuitive Kitchen. Yeah, it's it's great. I, I I actually gave her my old my old my first version Zoom recorder with two tracks, and I said, "You really want to do this?" I said, "You know, if you do this, you got to you can't just put a podcast out. You know, eight issues, ten issues, once a month, skip a week. Can't do that. If you're going to be a podcast, you got to take it seriously." Well, uh, the woman 
she just shocks me. She comes up with content. She comes up with series. She's had this podcast out for quite a while, and I'm talking about it now because I think it stood the test of time. She's got a nice listening base. Add that to your podcast list or her Instagram feed. There, there's a blatant commercial for my daughter, Jesse Holden. There you go. How about that, Jess? I know you're listening. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this episode. Um, it's, it's a little different. It's a little different. It's, it's with a fellow from New Zealand, and he's from the U.K., and he's a dog behaviorist. He's not a hunting dog behaviorist, but dog behavior is dog behavior. Hey, everybody. It's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. This is a first. This is a first-time <clears throat> episode. I have, I have had actual people ask me about dog behaviorists. I, I would say the closest I, closest I came to that was one of the founders of NAVDA. Uh, his name is Ed Bailey. He writes articles for Gun Dog Magazine, and he kind of addresses dogs, uh, you know, in the hunting dog world. He kind of ad- the best he can addresses in an email back to him in an article in the news in the uh, magazine, like behavior issues. And you know, being a, a a judge of hunting dogs, there's a lot of times I just wonder what what's going on here. You know, the genetics are there. Is the person not there? What's going on? And I I was reached out to. Um, Oh, probably a couple months ago, and when you hear when you hear Dan's first name, it's actually Dan, but but in his email and his, <laughs> his sorry Dan, I gotta go there. <laughs> and his email, no, and I think it's from his his publicist or his manager. His name on the email says Doggy Dan, and so when I got the email from Doggy Dan, I said, "Yep, not interested." <laughs> it just sounds like, "Oh, come on, it's Dog Dan, right?" It's, no, it's Doggy Dan, but. It was, Dan and I have had a couple conversations, and I am excited to get into dog behavior, whether it's, you know, uh, my wife's corgi or or my Brocco Italiano or my new dog. So, Dan, welcome to the show. How, how's things out in Auckland, New Zealand today? Oh, it's great. Thank you. Yeah, it is a, it's a great name, eh? Nobody ever forgets it. It's no, they don't. Funny. <laughs> How yeah, did... I actually met somebody once on the. Um, I went to do a consult, and I said, "How did you find out about me?" And they said, "We met you about six years ago on the beach, and we never forgot your name. And when we got a dog, we said, hey, I remember his name. It was Doggy Dan.' Because so, <laughs> uh... that's that's like coming to a. It's like you know, there's you know, I'm sure you've seen standard poodles, and there are there are standard yes. there are standard poodles that compete and do well in what we call the hunt retrieve or the hunt retrieve test. Um, yeah. And they're they're out there with the Labradors, and they're out there with the Chessies, and and the first time I interviewed a fellow who was running standard poodles, I said, "What does that feel like when you show up to the line with a poodle?" He says, "Well, once you get past the name, <laughs> you know, it's all performance, <laughs> right? It's all good." Uh, Dan, yeah, g- there, give was a, there was, <laughs> yeah, go on. Give give everybody a little background what you do, so I don't want to mess that part up. You you've been at this for a while, sure. Yeah, yeah. So I've had a, um, you could call it a checkered career. I qualified as a civil engineer. That was the whole plan, you know, build bridges. But there was no job, so I became a maths teacher. And, you know, I wasn't going to want to, I didn't want to be in a classroom for 20 years. So I did a bit of police work and then ended up in selling IT systems and finally ended up selling wine. And I thought, you know what, I want to find something I'm passionate about. So I went to a careers advisor over a decade ago. We figured out that my real passion was dogs even though I'd never grown up with one because my mom was terrified of dogs. And I took the brave, bold step of saying, well, I'm going to become a dog trainer just like that. And, um, and, and the secret was studying all the top dog trainers, taking the best bits from all of them, figuring out which ones kind of resonated with me and which ones didn't, and then kind of forming my own method. And um, I was very lucky to stumble across a wonderful lady in the UK called uh, Jan Fennell, who's called the Dog Listener. And took that method and, and tweaked it a bit and changed it a bit and developed my own style. And um, so briefly, I've worked with about 3,000 dogs in a one-on-one capacity. I've been to people 3,000 homes around New Zealand wow. where I live. Um, and you know, and some people have flown me overseas to islands in the Pacific to come and train their dogs, which has been fun. And um, and you know, I own, I'm only there for a couple of hours, and I share with people the real deep connection. How do you get this little fluffy animal? What's going on in that brain? 
Yeah. And, and yeah. that's my key piece. And I've put that all online. So I've got a huge online business where I think 60,000 people, mainly Americans, have logged on and trained their puppies and dogs. And um, so I don't claim to be a specialist in the hunting side of things, but I've got that foundation piece so I can really help people kind of understand their dogs a bit better, no matter what, what kind of career or road or place they are with their animal and their dog. Yeah, I mean, it, it's totally, you know, in, in my world, I think people are still, no matter what you do, you have to communicate. What, however your method is, you have to communicate with the dog. And I know enough to say, you know, without confusing the dog or without, you know, without being too heavy handed or without being too, you know, th there's, there's a whole lot of, th I mean, we struggle in, in the hunting world. Like, is it me? Is it the dog? Is it the, so let, <laughs> let's start out with some, like the, yeah, I, I yeah. sent you a, a list of things I'd love to cover and I hope we can cover them all. But the first one totally. really should be puppy development. So we get this, you know, I will ask you a question. It's very common for people to get a, a puppy at eight weeks. That seems to be the norm. Now, I've gotten some dogs at 12 weeks, and the behaviorist I talked about, Ed Bailey, um, he, his, his mantra as he has gotten older, um, maybe I shouldn't say as he's gotten older, as he's gotten a bigger voice, he would prefer these breeders, as long as you're a good, reputable breeder with a nice facility, to keep those puppies in their family unit, you know, to 10 and 12 weeks before we sell them. But wh what's puppy development? What does that look like for you when somebody says, if they called you before they got the puppy, what are they going to ask you? So if people call me beforehand, the main thing I usually point out is that you want to know what you're doing with your puppy before you get your puppy. It's no good getting the puppy and going, what do I do now? <laughs> because... <laughs> yeah. You know, the last thing you want to do is pick up a book and sit there reading when you've got a 10-week-old puppy to play with. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, puppies are the biggest wasters of time in the world. So you need to know, you know, all the rules of how to engage, how to interact with your puppy. Because a lot of people say, when should I start training my puppy? But the truth is you can't help but start affecting your puppy the second the puppy turns up. The minute the puppy comes into your house you're affecting how that puppy's development is, and that's puppy training, you know, that's puppy. So you, what I would say is make sure you're on, on, um, in the know with what to do before you bring that puppy home, you know, whether it's to do with how the other children should be, like human baby children should be interacting with the puppy or not. You know, I had to explain to somebody just the other day, your puppy needs a safe place. You can't have a four-year-old just going up to a puppy and grabbing it every time it tries to go and have a lie down. It needs a safe place. And then they're like, oh, maybe we should buy a crate. It's like, yeah, yeah, buy something. Or you don't have to have a crate, but create a safe place for that puppy to be able to escape and have a long, long sleep. And, and basically puppies, you know, they sleep 22 hours a day left to their own devices, right? Or 20-some hours a day. Um, do, exactly. Do you, th do you think people, when they get the dog, and again, this doesn't matter if it's my wife's next corgi, or someone's next German shorter, do you think they try to do too much too soon? Is it, is it an overload for the, for the dog? The way a dog uh, learns from, its, speaking, yeah, from a dog's yeah. wild you know, nature of being a pack animal, they, they, don't get the, they don't get English, French, German, and art class on the same day from their mom, right? Yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, I would say we probably do overload. And we put pressure on the dog. and Because what that does is we all want super, super dogs, the smartest, the brightest, the same as our, you know, we want our kids to be super smart and bright. We, <laughs> we want to be super, we, you know. But, but if you actually let the, the puppy follow its natural path, we all, humans and dogs, learn better when they're not under so much pressure. Too much pressure can ruin it. And the puppies, is, and I'm sure you know, you know, they pick up on the stress so much quicker than we realize so when we're stressed because the puppy's not learning as fast as we want, um, it, it, it can really affect the puppy, the puppy's development. They don't learn as well. Um, if you leave them, and, and of course, all puppies develop at different stages. So you might have a fairly, it may seem like you have a slow puppy up to five, six, seven months, but then they hit one year old and they just, boom, that's, they find their forte, they find their, their zone. So well, we need to go at the puppy's 
pace more than kind of going, I want the puppy to be the fastest and top of the class, and they should be at this point at this time. So you're saying we yeah. shouldn't buy a baseball and give it to our newborn child either, right? Hoping that he's going to be a major league baseball player. So we, we exactly. Just yes. Let them. So how does a person learn? I think this is the hardest thing in in the dog world. You know, and yeah. we refer to it as reading a dog. When I, I can yes. do it in a testing format, I'm reading the dog, but I'm actually only reading the dog's performance for 20 minutes. How does a person learn to read his dog signals? Ooh, that's a, that's a toughie. Question. That's a toughie, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I mean, I I would probably say keep keep clocking into the connection and the energy and feel. You know, I think as humans we need to start feeling more. Um, I'm talking about the gut instinct there mm -hmm. more than and getting out of our heads. Because when you start to feel nature, the gut instinct that what you're feeling, you know, is this bird. You know, you can look at a bird. And go, does that bird feel like it's going to fly away? Or does it feel like it's looking at me and I'm looking at, you know, when you start to feel nature, you'll be able to feel your dog more. Right. And, you know, even things like, can you, does it feel like it's going to rain? You're feeling it rather than, it's more a feeling in the body than, you know, something you're working out and calculating in your head if it's going to rain. You're feeling it. And it's got to be like that with your dog. Does it feel like my doggy wants to come towards me? Does it feel like my dog loves me? Does it feel like my dog wants to jump in the car and go for another walk? And, and then you can take it to the next level. Does it feel like my dog wants to do some training? Does it feel like my dog's enjoying this? And if the answer is no, then I'd ask the question, well, why, why do I think, why does the dog not want to do this? Is it because they're exhausted? Is it because I get angry? Or is it because they're just not stimulated? You know, they don't like, there's no treats, there's no food involved, or there's no ball, or they don't like doing fetch. Um, and, you know, we could even take that as an example, you know. I'm kind of jumping around here a bit, but... People say to me, you know, I've worked with thousands of dogs, and, and there was one man said, can you come and help me? Now, I, I charge quite a bit of money because I've done this a while. I've got a lot of experience. I said, sure. what's the problem? He said, well, I've got a border collie, and he won't fetch. <clears throat> I said, okay. So what, but what are the serious issues? Like, have you got, is he biting? You know, most people ring me because of barking, aggression, not coming when called. He said, no, he just won't fetch the ball. <laughs> I said, okay, does he have to? Well, no, but he's a border collie, so he should. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> I said to him, I said, y y I, I can't remember, where was he from? I think he might have been uh, from America because I remember saying to him, do you play American football? And he said, no. I said, but you're American, aren't you? I said, but don't all Americans play American football? <laughs> yeah, there no, you go. I said, <laughs> and, and, and so that's kind of taken it to another step. But it's like all these puppies and dogs are different. So we can't just apply this cookie-cutter approach to them because you do get border collies, some, who don't want to do um, fetch. And, of course, you could change that. You could somehow motivate the dog, but why bother? Why, why not find a border collie who loves running and getting the ball and wants to do that right. you know, hundreds of times a day? Well, when somebody has that dog that they have an expectation for, and yeah. it... it Genetically, it may or may not come out, right? I mean, there's like I said, there's yep. there's there's Labrador Retrievers. The most, you know, their last name is Retriever, you know, and there's Labradors yep. out there that won't retrieve. Now that could be more of a a game bird when it's shot, but that could also be a dog that's totally confused because this person might have played fetch with a tennis ball for ten minutes a day with this puppy. And all of a sudden he's a year old. Now he wants him to go retrieve a duck, and the duck's like, "I don't, I don't know, what you, I don't know what you want from me." <laughs> you know, get a tennis yeah. ball. How do we stop confusing our dogs? Because I think a lot of this comes to <clears throat> our dogs aren't under. How, how do we, how do we talk to our dogs? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> These questions are getting bigger and bigger. I know they are. I know. I'm not letting you off the hook. <laughs> No, but look, how do we talk to our dogs? I mean, what you touched on there for me is very much almost like, you know, I, I, I've got a son and in my mind I have this dream of how my son's going to be, but that's just my ego and that's just my dream and that's, I can't put that on my son. That's not fair. Right. And in, in some respects he's, he's blown me away with how amazing he is in terms of, you know, um, you know his art. It's incredible and I, I never had any of that gift. And there's other things that I used to like doing, which he's not. And so, you know, I can't have his life planned out for him. It's just not right. And much as you may want your dog to be a certain way, 
of course we can train them and of course we can change their temperament and personality a little bit. But, you know, if you've got one of the most bomb-proof, tough, stubborn, you know, strong-willed, aloof, dominant dogs, <laughs> you know, and I've got one, that's why I say it. I've got a dog who's actually a Catahoula cross, which are the Texan Catahoula dogs, so there's not many of them in New Zealand, but he is the toughest dog. He's the most like leader in a hundred dogs he would be like in the one percent of i'm a leader he doesn't need other dogs attention he's more human than dog he oh, wants that's... to hang out with the humans he... yeah and so he's never going to be a good dog to take to my puppy consults gotcha because he when he was a puppy he knew the rules at about 10 weeks old and i've got the video and he wasn't my dog originally but i took a video of this little 10 week old puppy and he's taken on 70, 80 pound um, Rhodesian Ridgebacks, and he's just telling them, back off. I may be a puppy, but you don't invade my space, buddy. I'll tell you off. And I'm like, wow, that's the most confident little puppy I've ever seen. And so he was born knowing all the rules, and he doesn't really tolerate idiots or fools, other dogs. Sounds like so John Wayne up, as a kid. <laughs> yeah, well, he, that's exactly it. So if another dog comes up sniffing his face, going, you're amazing. He's kind of like, yeah, I know I am, but get out of my face. And he'll grizzle once, and then he'll kind of tell him, get out of my face. Well, he's not a good puppy trainer, and he never will be. But what he is great at doing is calming down aggressive dogs, because he just lies on his back and rolls on his back and kind of says, I'm not scared, and the other dog calms down. See, so that, I've had to kind of, with him... Oh, I'm sorry, but that, that would almost sound like a submissive dog to a, a, a neophyte. So he's not submissive. He's, is this how a dog tells another dog they're not going to fight? Uh-oh. Where'd you go? Uh-oh. Well, when that, when that dog comes up around him, you, you mentioned that he gets on his back and, and, and kind of diffuses the situation. Is that how? Oh, okay. Yep. So I was describing um, two, different, two different situations. One is, um, so when there's a submissive dog comes up to him kind of in his face, he'll tolerate them and he's okay, but he just doesn't want these dogs kind of kissing his face and being in his face and licking his face. So what he does is he does a little growl and says, yeah, okay, you can follow me, but get out of my face. He's kind of intolerant with those submissive dogs. With the um, very aggressive dogs that sometimes he'll work with, and I'll have them kind of on a lead and there'll be another dog who's very aggressive holding their position and maybe growling and woofing. Well, many dogs would actually go into a defensive mode and maybe become a bit aggressive and bark back. But Jack's so confident, he often just lies down on his back and kind of, it looks like he's being submissive, but it's more a case of he's actually going, whatever, you don't scare me. Look, I'm just rolling on my back. And itch, he almost itches his back on the grass and stands up and just, he doesn't care. That's great. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That well, it makes it doesn't make sense, but it it kind of flies in the face of what I've seen with dogs. So maybe maybe we should yes. touch on that a little bit. So you, yes. if, you know, dogs are a pack animal, and you've got the alpha, yeah. and you've got you know in in the wild dog world, in the wolves and coyotes, they have their own language. They know who's boss. They know who eats first. Yep. How do our yep. dogs are, are our dogs still that? I don't want to say primitive. Do they still have that language that no matter who they are, they, they actually, even if, even if a fight breaks out, do they already know the winner of the fight? Or, or do they, how do they do that? Well, I wouldn't say they know the winner of a fight when there's a fight breaks out because, you know, it's, there's so many variables go on and, um, and both of them probably often think they're going to win. That's why they have a little bit of a tussle. Yeah. But there's certain primitive language is still there and that is really the beautiful thing when you when you can really read and feel the communication that's going on it, it is right there in front of your eyes but sometimes it's so subtle if i can give you one example of what i'm talking about when the two dogs meet you know you're probably aware of this but you know they're kind of nearly always in my opinion all of this is my opinion but they're nearly always deciding who's in charge me or you right that's why two dogs to meet on the beach or in the woods and they have this and there's nothing there there's no ball there's no stick there's no food what are they grizzling about and it's their way of grizzling about who's in charge now if you watch very subtly you'll see all the different ways they can decide who's in charge you know one can roll on their back 
very clear submission. But often the one that goes over the top of the other dog's neck. So if one dog puts his head over the back of the other dog, that's dominance. Well, what I noticed a couple of times, more than once, is sometimes the submission can be so quick. If you don't spot it, it almost looks like the, the, the dog who is actually submissive, it looks like they're being dominant. But I believe what's happening is if, like, um, if one dog comes in and very quickly, let's call it the, let's say the poodle meets the German shepherd. Mm -hmm. If the poodle comes in and very quickly dips the head underneath the neck of the, of the German shepherd, clearly showing a very quick submission, I've noticed that sometimes the German Shepherd can go, yep, you got it, I'm in charge. And that was all that was needed. Wow. It was almost like the poodle has paid respect. And it's so quick and so subtle that the German Shepherd might then stand there and the, you know, the poodle may then kind of look like it's dominating the German Shepherd. But they've actually just gone, I'm below you in the pack, do you want to play? <laughs> That's how quick it can happen. And the German Shepherd's gone, as long as you're below me and you understand that, good so they've almost created a game created a relationship the communication's there and we kind of sit there going oh my poodle's really submissive i can't believe it's dominating your german shepherd no it's a game now and what happened early on was the poodle submitted and that's how fast it is so if you don't know the language it can sometimes be very confusing do, do you get a lot of that I, I would have to imagine you do when people call you and say you know, I brought a second dog into the house, and yeah. I don't think they're going to get along. And this happens, with yes. again, with no matter what breeds of dogs and what, what yes. working dogs or toy dogs. Yes. Is, is that, is there something people Very can. Very common. Is, is that something people, is there a better way, <clears throat> I shouldn't say a better way. Is there a way if somebody said, Dan, I've got a, uh, you know, I've, I've got dog A, he's been here, he's three years old, and we're bringing in a new puppy what's a good yeah. – because we're not going to yeah. go into, like, crate training and treat training. No, no, But no. What's, what's a good path – and this, I think, relates to anybody because hunters especially, really known for having two and three dogs. Yeah, uh, yeah. What's a imagine. good way for a young dog to be introduced or vice versa to, uh, to each other? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, here's, here's – let me give you the best, um, the best answer I can give you. One of the things about dogs fighting in their own home is it is a very, very tricky problem to solve if you use traditional approaches. Here's why. Because usually those dogs are not fighting because they're scared of the other dog in terms of, you know, is that dog going to attack me? Because often, you know, the dogs, you know, they might live together for two weeks, three weeks, they're happy, especially if it's dogs of the same sex. You know, you say, let's just take an example. You've got two dogs, mm -hmm. both male. They get on for four months, five months, and then one of them, you know, just starts getting challenging the other one. And suddenly there's just these fights start happening every month. What's going on and how do you stop it? It's tricky to solve because it's not going to be solved by treats. And it can't, it's very tricky to stop as well using some sort of um, correction based approach. Because what is actually happening, in my opinion, is both the dogs are trying to be the top dog. And so the approach has to be. How do you show the dogs that you are the top, well, top dog or top human or the, the top person in the in pack the, or in the family? In the pack, yeah, in the pack, yeah. yeah. How do you say I'm the top of this pack? Because when you do that, both the dogs will go, okay, well, it's almost like once, once you know there's a leader in a group, nobody's fighting for kind of second place. Right. Kind and of like, once that leader disappears, yeah. Kind of like Al Capone in Chicago. They they just didn't mess with him. They just he's the leader. We exactly. can we can all have our little neighborhood spats, but Al's the, Al's yep. the boss. So does this exactly. come to and, and, having and once a, he disappears? Of course, then everyone starts fighting over who's the new boss. Right. So, once yeah. he goes to jail, it's it's gang warfare. So yeah. So is it as important? It sounds like to me is it's as important as to. I don't want to say establish dominance, but that's what we we call it. So you bring yep. your first yep. dog into the house. It's got to yep. be important to set those rules, like where he's already number two. He's never going to be number one dog. If you own, yep. if if you're whether you have a family or just a husband and wife, that dog has to understand yep. that he's already number two. He's never number one. Yeah. Look, you, you're dead right. That's the best approach. 
However, because and I, I love talking about this because so much of what I do is really around this area, whether you've got two dogs or three dogs, you know, it doesn't matter how many dogs. You know, I've worked with packs of 30 dogs at yeah. doggy daycares, the big breeds. And what's beautiful is this approach really does work. That's why I'm so passionate about it because when you walk around a pack of 30 dogs and you're the one in charge, so you walk in and they all calm down. Okay, he's here. No more fighting. You know, you've got, you, you're on the, you know, you're on the money. Yeah. And so... The, whether you've got one dog, you, you know, it's best to put it in place straight away. It's always best just to put it in as soon as possible, best before you get a second dog. But even if you've got two dogs who are fighting, you know, it's, it's all about establishing, as you say, the dominance or the leadership. And when I say dominance, it, it's the method that I use. The reason I love it is because it doesn't – you don't have to shout at the dog. In fact, it's better if you don't. Right. You save your voice and you don't have to smack the dog or hurt the dog. Or cause the dog any pain and um you know i'll just say it ron that if anybody is looking for help in that area because i know how much struggle and strife people get with having more than one dog and the stress it causes in a house is phenomenal oh my god yes and um <laughs> and that's where the main program on my website the online is exactly what it deals with it deals with how do you establish that pack leadership and that structure and it's pretty much that's the only thing you need or 90 percent of what you need is how to establish who's in charge in the house and then that dog fighting in the same house it just stops you know that <clears throat> I, I i'm kind of softballing this i'm kind of setting up a t-ball yeah. question for you yeah. so the yeah. the project that justin and i worked on and this was for you know training your upland dog for uh, your upland pointing dog for for yeah. hunting and there are some things I used to do with my dogs early on. You know, I'd read a book and say, oh, I should do that with the dog. And one of the things that I watched him do while we filmed this for 15 months was every dog. It's a little bit of wait to come out of the crate, wait to be fed, wait your turn. You don't go through the door before me. Is it those simple little things that put the dog in their place without any violence, so to speak? I hate saying violence, but, you know, without yeah, an yeah. overreaction. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, those those little micro decisions definitely um, have that impact. And I often say to people, you know, you want to give your dog some free time, of course, um, but just be aware that you know when you want your dog to switch on and listen to you, you should be able to get their attention. Otherwise, you know what's going on. You know, so so yeah. And one one of my questions and, and it's to also you. Also, what you touched on is yeah. the calmness. Yeah. What, you, what you're touching on as well, Ron, is is being able to get the dog to settle and be calm. And so the more you do that, the more the dog understands. When the dog's calm, good things happen. Well, and that's so funny because one of the segments that, that I learned from Justin was what he calls a calming touch. He takes a young dog and puts it up on a raised platform, whether it's a table or a tailgate. And, you know, he just kind of runs his hands down the back and up the legs and moves. He looks like he's stacking them up for a show at Westminster, but... And in the beginning, they kind of resist it, but after a while, they're just like, oh, that's, he's just moving my legs and stroking my tail. And it, so that's got to be that early, without any real effort on your part or any, again, I don't want to say anger, but the dog is just like, oh, I, it's kind of making that dog trust you almost, isn't it? Totally. It's totally what it is. And, and that trust is so huge because the more the dog... For me, trust, let me go back to what the word trust means. Trust means that I've got your best interests at heart. Yeah. That, that the dog goes, this doesn't look good to me. This doesn't, I don't feel like this is right or safe, but my, I don't know whether you want to say leader or parent or caregiver or whatever, pack yeah. leader, yeah. You know, is saying do this. And I've always found that they look after me and good things happen. So I'm going to trust them. And, um, oh, yeah, good thing happened. Wow, he knows best. I can trust him. And so one of the games, just as an example, that I, I play with my little pup is, um, I, you know, people say, how do I get, you know, if you can't get a bone or something off your dog? Well, when they're very young, if you say to the dog, you know, give, give me the bone and, and then you give them an even bigger thing back, that develops huge trust. Just, that's just specific around the food. But right. when the dog goes, what, you want me to stop eating and you want to take the bowl away? Well, if you run off for the food and don't give them anything back, they go, well, I'll know never to trust you. And if you try and take my food, I'll, you know, snap at you. But if you take the bowl away and then add some more meat, 
and give it back, the puppy goes, wow, you can take my bowl in. <laughs> That's like grandma giving you an extra cookie just because you were quiet. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one of the things I wrote to you that I've always, I'm, a, I'm an analogy person. I, I love to compare things. And I've always told mm. people, um, and one of the things I wrote to you is comparing young dogs to the behavior of children. And, yeah. you know, I'm a parent. Uh, well, now I'm a grandparent. And I'm, I'm already being a little critical of my own grandkids. But my wife did an excellent job with the first three, right? And yeah. there was, it seemed like it was a lot of, there was a lot of rules. But they had a lot of, they had a lot of, they had a lot of fun. But there was just like some rules that you don't do this. And I, I always tell people like, look, how, how is it that my mom could get me to be quiet in church? Like we went to church when we were little kids. And I was never quiet in school. She had to go down to school all the time. But somehow, in church, I'm like, well, this is really important. So it's like, I, 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 wanna, I hate to say this, but is every problem we have because we kind of screwed up the foundation? Or, or are, there some, are there some dogs that, you, you know, that break the rules? Well, that was a great question. It's another, you don't ask small, narrow questions, eh? No, no, I don't, <laughs> no. <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, I love it. I, look, Ron, i got to be honest. I, I've never mentioned this to you, but I actually um, had a book published by Random House and uh, Penguin, Penguin Random House Book Publishing, and it's called What the Dogs Taught Me About Being a Parent. Oh, for God's sakes. No, you did not tell me that. Yeah, so that's on Amazon. And what's um, and there's an audible version as well, if you like listening. But I, I so I couldn't agree more. The similarities between being a parent and being a um, a dog owner there are so many. Right from the from the big stuff, right down to the micro, from the macro to the micro. And so here's my if I can give you a quick story or quick analogy, please. And yeah. I think it explains everything. You know, when you're a child, we've all been in school where you sit down and there's a maybe a little teacher and she may be a frail 60, 70-year-old lady, you know, or 80-year-old lady, and she says, sit down, pick up your pens, turn to page 55 and be quiet. Mm -hmm. Everybody just does it. She's got the respect. And, the, and then that same class of students goes down and there may be a younger student, much better teacher, much younger teacher, bigger, stronger, and he says, you know, all right, he says the same thing. Sit down, be quiet, turn to page 55, and the kids just ignore him. And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. The question is, do the children understand what sit down, be quiet, and turn to page 56 means? Yes. So do they need training? No. They know what it means already. It's a lack of respect. It's a lack of leadership. And that older teacher knows how to win the respect. If you think of training dogs as more like that than you know, the stupid children don't know what sit down and be quiet means, and that's where we get it all wrong. We think that the dogs don't understand. They do. They're just kind of going, screw you, I'm not listening to you. <laughs> yeah, I've owned two of them like that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, the number of times where I've actually, people have said they've got a dog who pulls on the lead and mm -hmm. it's a nightmare and they've been pulled over and they can't take the dog for a walk because it's too dangerous. And I've sat there with them in the house and the dog started kind of eating out of my hand, so to speak. And then I've said, well, should we take the dog for a walk? And they're like, oh, you don't want to do that. You know, I stand up, the dog's calm. And they go, he doesn't normally do that. He normally does backflips when you pick the lead up. And I say, come here. He comes calmly, sits calmly. And they're like, I can't believe it. Wait till you open the door. I open the door and I just move my leg gently across and say, wait. And then we walk out calmly. And they, they literally just can't believe it. They are so, not angry, but in disbelief. Like the little, the little bugger, he knew all along how to walk on the lead. <laughs> because I never trained him to walk on the lead. He just said, you're in charge, you go first and I'll walk calmly by your side. And some of the dogs, even you can see them, they're even laughing at the owners going, you know, I always knew how to do it. I just I, wouldn't I, do it for you. <laughs> you made me think of like, at, at a test situation, there's 10 pickup trucks, right? And one of the yeah. other dogs is like, hey, you really want to piss off your owner? Yeah, as yeah. soon as you get out of the yeah. truck, just start acting like a squirrely kid. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, then the, and then the person's there, you know, he's in front of the judges and he's like, He's almost, he's, he becomes afraid of his own dog for a minute 
You know, yeah. he's like, oh, I've, I've, I've never seen him do this. I'm like, really? You ne- never saw him do this, you know? Yeah, yeah. But oh, so they are, they're having a laugh. Half the, the time, they're just having a laugh. They know. Yep. So what would you say, and, and this is a total guess here on my part, I, and I've told people mm. this. I, I've had people call me, you know, I, because of the podcast. I mean, people will send me some questions. It's like, really? You don't know the answer to that? You know, they'll send me the simplest questions. And I always, and a lot of times I've asked them, I said, do you have kids? And I said, you know, just let's say to crate training. I said, do you have kids? Yeah. I said, well, do you know what happens if you, if every time you put your kid in the crib when it's time for a nap, if he cries and fusses and you go in there, the, do, the, the child has learned that, oh, all I got to do is cry and fuss and mom's com- mom comes back. So... Yep. It, it's just like that with dogs. I, I've always used that analogy. It's like, like, no, if it's crate time, you put him in the crate, you let him basically cry himself to sleep. It's, there's no, it's almost like the crate's telling him to go to sleep, you know? How yep. long does that last, though? Because there, that analogy, you know, it, as a puppy develops, you know, they get to be a, you know, I always think of a, you know, a dog being able to, let's say, reproduce at 10 or 12 months. Cause, so they go, from, they go from birth to, let's say, full-blown teenager, probably in about 10 to 12 months in some cases. I don't know. But yep. then yep. the analogy loses it because I'm always using these analogies for little kids. Oh, yeah. Okay. But it, it, in my opinion, it carries on, Ron. Let okay. me take an example at the other end of the spectrum. When you've got this old dog who's 12 years old, and um, people go, ooh, do you think we should get another dog? <laughs> it's like, well, there's a question. Because just like with some people, there's some older people, you know, 70-year-old. I don't know if 70 is still classed as old. As I get older, you know, it gets hard. But this is 70, 70-year-old. Does a 70-year-old want a young, you know, 10-year-old coming to live with them? (laughs) Probably not. (laughs) Probably not. (laughs) But there's some 70-year-olds who would go, you know what? This little fella, he's a good fella. Because it depends on the person. If it's an old man who likes fishing and he's on his own, and suddenly there's a 10-year-old boy turns up who loves fishing and he's a good kid. And suddenly this 70-year-old man's gone, you know, you've brought so much joy to my life. I've come back alive. I've stopped fishing. I mean, there's a movie right there, right? They all oh, my God. You just, you just did a, a – yeah, you got a half a movie script yeah. already. <laughs> yeah, and the little boy finds his granddad's fishing rod and says, what's this? And they start catching fish. It's a new – so that can be the 12-year-old dog who's just given up and just kind of no more fun, doesn't want to walk. And they get this little puppy – Especially if the puppy's the right puppy, as in it's a female maybe, and it's younger, a smaller breed, so it's not going to be able to jump on top of the, the older dog and hurt him. And suddenly this older, big 12-year-old Rottweiler starts going, hey, this little cavoodle puppy thing's the greatest thing in my life. I love this. I'm back alive, and it wants to go walking, and the little cavoodle's jumping on him. But it can go the other way. You know, you can have some older dogs. They just want to be left to sleep. They don't want another little stupid right. dog turning up. And and, and and especially when people get the wrong puppy, you know, there was a lady who actually had Dachshunds, two older Dachshunds, and she got a Rottweiler. And I said, that's the wrong puppy because that, those Dachshunds can't correct the Rottweiler when the Rottweiler is seven, eight months old and trying to jump on them. No, you know? no. That's like having a, a like, you know, yep. taking on a, <laughs> a, a babysitting job of a, a person that's three times your size. And you're trying to say. No, I want you to sit down. It's like I don't have to sit down. I don't yeah, have to listen to you. That's another movie. That's a that's a horror movie right there. I think well. we should yeah, be writing cool. a movie script, Dan. I, <laughs> I'm telling you. So it does carry on. The point is, you know, in my opinion, the the correlation and the similarities and the connections, because so much of this is about if you go to the deepest level with our dogs, it's actually about the energy, the energy connection, but the, what they're feeling, what we're feeling. And how we're communicating, what what messages we're communicating. Hmm. This this is going to be again one of these questions. I told you they'd be coming out. Um, mm-hmm. So going to the I, I know this is not your your lifestyle, but the hunting dog world. Okay, people yep. have yep. A, a kennel of uh, two or three dogs, sometimes more dogs, and uh, they um, they 
compare one like they think this they think the next dog is going to do just what the last dog did. Yeah, yeah. You know, or or the next like my wife's a perfect example. Her first two corgis <laughs> were a shit show, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> okay. They totally ran rough shot over her. And the only way they would come in is if you took some plastic bag and, and crinkled it. Right? Yep. And now this next one she got, same breed of dog. It's just, it's cooperative, you know? So yeah. there's a whole lot of things we need to do with every dog when we get one, whether it's a puppy or a rescue. There's like rules, but is, yeah, this, I know this is going to be a bad question. Are there dogs that are just like father? There's a movie that I loved growing up. It was Spencer Tracy. Yeah. It was called Boys Town. Okay. Yeah. And he took on all these orphans. It was, you know, it was at the Depression. This is an old black and white movie from the late 30s or early 30s. And uh, his mantra was there's no such thing as a bad boy. He just needed mm-hmm. to give yeah. them structure and, and love and, you know, in, in a place. But genetically, or, or maybe it's not even genetically. Are there some dogs that like are just almost? I don't want to say bad dogs, but are there career criminal I mean, dogs? <laughs> or <can> be a... <laughs> <laughs> look I, I, again. I would take it back to people and yeah. look at people. Mm-hmm. You know, I literally, I actually did work with a family. They had five children, and four of them were sat on the couch listening to me as I shared the training. And they, they were beautifully behaved and calm. And the fifth one, this little girl, she was like the rebel. Of, it was insane how <laughs> different she was. She was just trying to smash stuff up and just be you know, dramatic and get attention. And they literally said, we should have stopped at four. At four. <laughs> and they were smiling and shaking their head because they knew they had four beautiful children. And they were like, we thought we had it. We thought we knew exactly. We couldn't understand parents who had problem kids. And then we had the fifth. And they actually, the crazy thing was, you know, I can't remember if it was the same family or not, but I've worked with people who've had four Dobermans and they've been absolutely fine. And then they get a fifth, same thing. They're like, man, the fifth Doberman. It's like, we've never seen anything like it. Yeah. So the point is that within every breed of dogs, there's the full spectrum of dogs. Yeah. And it's yeah. just like within every group of people, you know, like not all Americans are calm, friendly, and happy. And no. not all of them are violent. And not all of them are scared. And same with English. Some are violent, some are friendly, some are aggressive, some are peaceful. Yeah. Same with Maori, some with same with Australians, same with every race, you get that full spectrum. So that's the kind of the first thing. And then in terms of are oh, there some real bad eggs? I mean, I guess it's the same with people. Yeah, what can there's, you say? Yeah, there's that Charlie Manson, people, right? We can't explain Charlie Manson, right? Or there's some Yeah. <laughs> yeah there's <laughs> some tricky ones out there. But what I would say is with dogs and I believe with humans, you know, is it nature or nurture? Right. And, you know, and even in my book, you know, what the dogs taught me about being a parent, there's a whole chapter on is it nature or nurture? There's a chapter. And what I would say is I believe that the the raising the nurture side of things plays a far bigger part than you we can ever imagine. I would I would it's agree with like, that. I would agree with yeah. that. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. That you're given this, you know, this, this baby puppy or this child is born. They have certain personality characteristics built into them that they may be physically stronger or more intelligent or more challenging or stubborn or strong willed. But you can the impact we can have on them is just phenomenal. And that's the beauty of raising children and dogs. Yeah. No, that, that, that is that. that that's an analogy I love to hear because I, I felt that way too. It's like I, I saw a guy that was handling his dog. He's I would I would call him a, he's not a buddy of mine, but when we see each other, we're very cordial and we're in the same in the same outdoor world. <clears throat> and I watched two of his dogs four years apart do the same terrible job of retrieving something for us, right? I'm like, yeah. okay, those two dogs were not related. That was all nurture. That all came from the owner. He he did something wrong twice, yes. right? Yes. Whatever that little link, he could get the dog to be steady or he could get the dog to come when called. But when it came to the retrieving part of it, both of those dogs, two different gene pools, 
both said, oh, he's not serious. We don't have to be serious, you know. Yeah. So I would yeah. agree. I would agree. I think if we do our homework, the, the nurture part has got to have the weight. Yeah. 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 And, and yet I would balance it up that, you know, just like with people, if you get a if you get a guy who just likes painting and art and listening to music and doesn't really like anything physical at all, maybe a little bit of ballroom dancing or something. Right. You know, he, he's never going to become a top fighter. No, never going to become a top boxer. Right. You just you can't swing it that far. And just like I saw my dog, Jack, at 10 weeks old and went, whoa, that is the most dominant creature I've ever seen. Right. He's never going to be like this dog that wants to raise puppies. That's not his skill. <laughs> right. That's not, his That's not in his thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So a couple, yeah. of, I want to say these are, I don't want to say these are myths, but um, I've heard many people say it, and I said it back in the day. Do you think, again, this is from Dan, do you think there are dogs that resonate more with one gender or the other? Let's say it's a male dog with a, a uh, uh, mom and dad and two kids or a female dog? Or do you think that still goes back to the pack mentality of raising them? Or do you think there is any validity to this dog, for some reason, likes women more than men? Because I'm sure you've heard it. Mm, it's a fascinating question. It's almost a whole topic. I know. The, what I, know. I would definitely say. What I would say is the dogs definitely 100% know the sex of the person. There's no doubt about that. You know, they, so they know that's woman, that's man. It's clear as bell to them. I guess the tricky part for me is that you don't really get to see the same dog tested multiple times with multiple people. You know, they may be right. in a house with a man and a woman, and that male dog may be very connected to the man, but you may be able to see that the man's actually incredibly calm and the man takes him out for runs, and the dog loves running. So, yeah, the bond is there for that reason. And if you could take that same dog and put him in a house, maybe the, maybe the woman was a bit nervous and scatty, and the dog's kind of like, ah, that's not what I'm attracted to. If you could take the same dog and put it in a house where the woman was a runner and very calm, and, and the man was a bit scatty and neurotic, it would be a testing <laughs> test. But we never get to see that test, if you know what I mean. Right, right. It, it's like an impossible test, because once we have this, what we would call a problem or a yes. thought in our head, we've already cemented in the, the, the process to it. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so what, but what I have seen and what I would say is, is I would say, you know, you're in the wild, there's an alpha male and an alpha female in the wolf pack. Right. And it definitely feels like the dogs kind of will often kind of, you know, you can have a female. If you get a female human, I've often seen male dogs very much step up into that kind of more protective role with that female, especially if they're a, you know, a softer, gentler kind of, um, kind of, they want to be protected. The male dog will absolutely go into that role. I'm not saying the females can't, but I would probably say I've seen it more where, yeah, there, there can be that connection. But if I was to take it back to humans, there are some men who would far rather hang out with they may be physically attracted um, sexually to women, but they may go, you know what, I'd prefer to hang out with my mates. Yeah, yeah. So this is where it gets really confusing because, you know, I feel like my, my dogs, my two male dogs, they certainly kind of are a bit more protective around my wife, I would say. But they kind of love hanging out with me like as a mate. So it's hard to see the, you know what I mean? It's hard to see who they love the most and what reason. So that's where it can get blurry, but... Uh, you know, and, that, yeah. that, that's amazing because you said something that resonated with me. I, a, a friend of mine I met through work about, oh, 15 years ago, he was getting new into, the, he never had it, well, he had, I think they had some schnauzers, but he wanted a bird dog once he met me and I took him to a few places and there was an opportunity for a dog that came out of a, a dog of mine <clears throat> and uh, he ended up naming, the, it was a German wire hair and it was named Philo. And Scott told me, he said, nothing can ever happen to this dog because my, his wife, I don't want to say was handicapped, but she was very mild, very, like, she had yes. a, a few health problems. And that dog, without, literally without any work from Scott or his wife, took it upon himself to protect Scott's wife. Yeah. Almost to a point of a little bit of danger once in a while, you know. Yeah. 
And that dog just was like, it's almost like that dog said, that woman needs me. That, yes. that woman needs Superman or, or, you know, Iron Man. And literally, yeah. you, if, if a friend came over, if anybody, it, that dog just took it upon itself. It's so funny you said that, and I never heard anybody else say that. I always just thought the dog was a little screwy, <laughs> you know. Well, and yeah, it, you know, and, and it was a male so dog, then, and it it yeah, and it really didn't listen to her really good, because it, it no. she, she didn't do much with it, but yeah, it was just like attached to her at the hip, like yeah. You, my job so, is to protect you. Here's here's I'll just go for it, uh, and I hope this doesn't um, come across the wrong way, but. I, I've worked with thousands and thousands of dogs, and one of the patterns I've seen is, you know, sometimes a, let's just say a female lady will want that powerful dog to protect them, and they will almost let the dog kind of dominate them a little bit. You know, the dog comes over and right. pushes onto them, and she kind of goes, well, I don't mind. I don't mind the dog. He loves me. So she lets the dog invade her space. Now, what's, what they don't realize is happening, the dog is just dominating her, invading her space. Oh. And dogs that are allowed to invade your space will be far more protective of you. So that is a fairly typical pattern that you then have this dog who is very protective of the female, the person, the lady. Mm -hmm. But the man may be far more standoffish and like, I don't want the dog on me and pushes the dog away. And so the, the man can then take the dog for a walk and the dog's not dog aggressive, but around the lady... The dog's very aggressive yeah. around the dogs. But and, then that all so goes, again, that all goes to back to the way we raised them, doesn't it? It almost exactly. it keeps, it keeps going back to the nurture side of things. Yeah. 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 Because what often happens, we don't realize, is the dog picks up on our subliminal thoughts. And so we maybe actually want a dog to protect us. And, and the dog goes, yeah, I can feel it. They can feel the energy of what we're feeling and thinking far more than we realize. And, you know, a great example of this was I worked with um, a police. I didn't even realize she was a police officer. That was the whole point. But she said the dog was aggressive when she walked outside. And I went through everything. And it was like they'd done some great training with the dog. They had great understanding of dogs, the man and the woman. And the man, I think, worked in IT. He was calm. She was a police officer lady. She was calm. But when the dog went outside with the man, it was fine. When it went out with the lady, it was very on edge and protective and looking out for trouble. And it, But I hadn't realized she was a police officer. And I said to her, you know, just before we went out, I said, what do you do for a living? Do you mind me asking? Because I asked because sometimes it does have a huge impact. Yeah. She said, I'm a police officer. Now, I'd been a police officer, so I actually knew exactly what it's like to walk the streets. Even when you are off duty, you still keep an eye out. You know, you, you're still looking around the streets to see what's going on, to see if there's any trouble. And I said to her, do you feel relaxed when you're walking? She said, no, I feel like I'm still on duty. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I said to her, do you feel stressed? She said, a little bit, yeah, because I'm looking out for trouble. And we kind of got to the bottom of it of how stressed she actually felt. And I truly believe, and I explained, I think the dog's just picking up on your stress and anxiety. And um, she agreed. She totally agreed. We got to the bottom of it. And, you know, if you can change how your energy, the energy you're giving off, you know, it changes everything. That, yeah. And that goes down to, this is going to go into the dog training thing for, so we've got this dog. We do the foundation, right? We we set our boundaries. Um, I'm just trying to paint a, a, a perfect picture here. We, yeah. we Let's yeah. say we've done everything as right as we could. We, we've we've called we've called Dan. We've done research. We we set boundaries, but now we want to take our dog to like a higher level of training, whether it's agility or hunting. So now we're going to train this dog to do something that it doesn't do now. You know, dogs have X amount of impulse control, right? Like in a bird yes. in a bird dog, <clears throat> if it's a pointing dog, its instinct is there to point a bird when it smells a bird. And I, yes. I, I've had a thousand people write me like, oh, my dog's not pointing. I said, just hunt it. it. Just hunt it for a while. It's going to quit busting bird. We call it busting a bird when it doesn't point. And its instincts will kick in because it's in that particular breed that the pointing instinct is strong. And it's now all of a sudden it's like, you're right. I, I hunted him for the whole season, and now he's pointing. But then in our world, we're like, I would like this dog to 
not only point the dog or point the bird, but when the bird flies, I don't want my dog to chase the bird. That's being called steady. So when yep. we're asking our dog to do something that's like above and beyond their, like, <sighs> their instincts are to point, but their instinct yes. is also to chase. Yes. And without training, our dogs are always going to chase the bird that flies, which is, isn't a real problem for a lot of people. But when it comes to, like, say, higher level training, is the... I know the foundation's important, but, like, how do we get these points across? Like, I'm asking you to do something that's not in, in, in your, in your yes. makeup. Like, yes, yes. Well, I mean, first of all, I just want to acknowledge I'm not, a, I'm not an expert or a specialist in this field at all. But right. I've got some thoughts. The first thing is the foundation sometimes can have a massive impact on that sort of stuff. So in the same way that with a lot of dogs, you know, you know, I've literally, I've literally worked with people in the houses where I, I've worked on the foundation and I didn't even know the dog was aggressive to other dogs. It had separation anxiety problem. It was chewing through the doors when the man left it. So yeah. that's why I was there. He didn't tell me it was aggressive to dogs. Two weeks later, he sends me an email saying, thank you. The dog's separation anxiety is totally stopped and he's no longer aggressive to dogs. <laughs> and I was like, well, you didn't tell me he was aggressive. How aggressive was he? And, he, you know, oh, he was savage. He would attack the cows. <laughs> I'm like, well, there you go. That was a little bonus. But the point is sometimes that foundation can affect everything. Okay. Because the dog's nervous system settles. It's teed in with you. Just like the children in the classroom, when you win the respect of their minds, you say sit down and turn to page 56. You didn't do any training about how to sit on a stool. They already knew it. But now they're listening. So it can have a massive impact, which is why I love the program and the method that I use. The, but in terms of practical stuff, what I always try to say to people is break it down. If, if you're struggling, um, break it down to an even easier, an easier stage for your, for your dog, which sometimes can be tricky if you're working with kind of birds, which are suddenly kind of flying out of the grass. And stuff. Right. You, you're, That's, you're working with like, the, you're, you're kind of almost going back to the wolf or the coyote or, you know, the, the wild dog here. Um, make it, making it simple, you mean? Well, yeah, but you, we want to, like, we want to take that one, we want to, we want to work on our impulse control, right? Yeah. Their, their yeah. impulse and is just genetically to, I, I'm sure it would be a, I, I could break it down to like, okay, pet dog, hunting dog, working dog. Let's say we have a dog that's just running around the yard. We're having a good time. We're on a, on a walk with them. We'd like to teach them the one in, 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 in the States, we call it whoa, which means stop, stop running, stop running until yep. I tell you to, you can go again. Yep. How do you, how do you take a dog that's well behaved, doing everything yep. he's, he's doing, say, I would like to teach this dog to stop on command. Just stop, stop yes. what he's doing. Yes. So when I mentioned before that you basically break it down into smaller and smaller stages. It's almost like you try and make it easier and easier. You set the dog up to win. So to start with, you might just be running around, I don't know, throwing a ball. Right. Say the ball's the lowest. And, and then you say, you know, whoa, 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 whoa. And then I would immediately reward the dog. So it's, it's do something which is so easy that you make sure the dog has got that word whoa, and at least it understands whoa means stop. And then I would just increase it. The key bit is... Rather than suddenly bringing a bird in and shouting, whoa. <laughs> right, right, which a lot of people do, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's, this is the thing. And this is the thing. We jump so quickly that the dog can't handle the jump. And if it can't handle the jump, you just got to figure a way of making it easier. So, I don't know, you might put two balls in there, or you might have two dogs in one ball. Or you might have, you know, you might train both dogs individually to stop on the whoa. And then the repetition of doing it when they've got it right is huge. And so a bit like I'm teaching my son at the minute to surf, and I'm saying to him, just do 10. You know, you lie, you paddle, you put your right foot back, your back foot, you bring that forward, you slowly stand up. So he's doing it in the front room, 10 a day, every day, 10 of those. That's before we get on the water, you know? Okay. And so that repetition, and it's the same with the dog. The problem is we jump so quickly with the dogs, and then we go, well, he can do this, but he won't do that. 
And that's like, you know, jumping from a, a 20, 30 pound bench press and then we suddenly stick 200 pounds on it and we go, well, what's the matter? You can do that, but why won't he lift that? Yeah, it goes back to we're not, we're, we're, we're kind of going at it too fast sometimes. We're just going at it too fast. And what happens, as you know, same as with children, you know, if I start pushing my son out into big waves, he falls off. He doesn't succeed. He fails again. I get a bit frustrated. I tell him he's doing it wrong. He gets upset, starts crying. I tell him to stop crying. Get him back on the board, man. You know, oh, dear, man. So, you know, so you're, you're, a, better off. you're a great dog trainer and a terrible parent, Dan. Well, well no, no. I'm kidding. I mean, I'm, I'm kidding. not saying that's what I would do. <laughs> I know. I'll be honest. The old me was more in that way of, come on, I want you to do this. But right. The new me, the new father, and that's why I wrote the book. It's more kind of, if he can have fun. And it's the journey rather than the destination. If I can go and take him down the beach, and we actually had this. We went surfing. I paid for this really expensive surf lesson because I'm from England. We don't really surf. I'm not. Anyway, of course not. The water's too cold. <laughs> exactly. We went surfing anyway. And I, we went down the beach. It was a beautiful sunny day. I thought, perfect. We went there. I have never seen water so flat. <laughs> of course. <laughs> there was a ripple. And I was so disappointed, but I didn't say anything. Well, there were these waves came through, six-inch waves and then kind of one-foot-high wave. Well, at the end of the lesson, the kids were so happy. They said to me, Dad, you know the best thing was those waves weren't so dangerous. They didn't, because we live on the wild west coast, whereas these waves were on the east coast where it's flatter. They said they were brilliant, Dad. We actually could get on them, and, and they did. And it was like, that's what they needed. They needed that micro step rather than... Yeah. The bad experience of, you know, you push it, you rush, you fall, you scratch your knees. It's too much too soon. So when it comes to, it, again, it, it does, you know, kids and dogs, they are so similar. So in the same analogy, you know, like less is more and easier is better. Just, but you have to, sometime you have to proof it, right? You have to, you got to build yeah. up, you got to build up to, you yeah. know, that, that dog or that child that's like, I get it. But yeah. if, if you throw him into the surf and he keeps falling off the surfboard, yeah. well, yeah. You, you're just, you know, even. And, and, and I've got quite a creative brain, Ron. So my brain is going, okay, so you want to know how to go from a ball and two dogs to stopping a dog from chasing a bird. So my brain's gone, okay, so here's the next step after the two dogs and the ball. Mm -hmm. You get a soft toy and you throw the soft toy and you shout, whoa. Or you have a, and if the dog still chases the soft toy as you're throwing it, well, maybe have the soft toy stationary. Or well, have it on a little string, and the string goes around a tree. So you pull the string, and the, this soft toy starts moving along the ground, and you shout, whoa. And if the dog still moves, well, don't pull on the string. So it's just a soft toy. The point is we often push it until the dog fails, whereas we want to be making it so the dog succeeds. Yeah. And if the dog succeeds, repeat, 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 repeat on the success so the yeah. dog gets it. Yeah, and, and reward it with <clears throat> meat and cheese, or whether cheese is good or not, I don't know. Who cares? Say cheese isn't good <laughs> Hot for the dogs. dogs. Said, well, it's moldy fat. Of course it's not good for them. It's not good for us either. But, you know, whether you feed your dogs beautiful treats and they go, okay, so if I don't chase that toy, when you say, whoa, you give me a little meaty treat. Okay. And then you pull on the string and this, this fluffy toy that looks like a bird starts moving across the ground and you shout, whoa, and they stop and they get... Next thing, you're hooking it up into the tree branch and you're pulling it so it comes off the ground and shouting whoa <laughs> and the point is as long as you set the dog up to, to succeed you get closer and closer and then the jump to a dog a bird flying out of the grass is like oh this is just like at home whoa it's it's like it's not a big deal it's not a big deal yeah it's, it's just not a big a, jump it's just a, a it's a thing i learned in step so i mean we i think in general we could say that everybody's guilty not everybody People who've done it and listened to you or listened to me or, or done classes understand that, you know, slower is better for sure. Not slower is better, but steps are better. Yeah. Just expand on yeah. the steps. Yeah, yeah. Repeat, success, finish on a win. And, and the secret for me is probably when your dog gets it right, don't immediately progress and make it harder. It's almost like come back to the bar and the weightlifting. You know, you're lifting 30 pound on the bar. You know, you might put 40 or 50 on and 60 and just that's the max. But you don't go, well, let's stick 80 on. I can hardly do 80. Let's see what happens 100. Oh, I've just injured myself. Yeah. That's how you go backwards. Yeah. You, 
so you really got to work up to it slowly and then you, it's like the tortoise and the hare you know it is actually right. way quicker to go slowly and you can yeah, it's way yeah. quicker to go slowly you're right i think that's great it is yeah so yeah. one of the things on our scorecards or two of the items on our scorecard um is obedience and cooperation and let's take the golden retriever you know i, I don't want to say all golden retrievers but i'm going to go i'm going to go on the uh what they call that the uh the 50-50, I would say just known golden, ret- golden retrievers, that they're pretty much great family dogs. They have, to what I think, they kind of adapt well to, you know, whether they lived in an apartment or they lived at the lake. And the, what they give you is that cooperation is that, like, it's almost like they kind of get it. Like, like, oh, yeah, I get it. You know, there are some dogs that just get it more than others. So yeah. how do we know there's got to be some dogs. I'm going to go back to the kids. When I was in eighth grade, I was a terrible seventh grade student. But, you know, my Miss O'Connor, she, she hated me in seventh grade. Hated me. And it was terrible. Mm. In eighth grade, Mrs. Fleming, she could, it goes back to that, that old teacher you said it. When you said that a, an hour ago, I was like, oh, my God, he's talking about Mrs. Fleming, my eighth grade teacher, right? <laughs> yeah. She literally paid attention to us boys that were a little rambunctious, and yeah. she had total control on us. But do you think there is a definite difference in cooperation levels of breeds that you've seen? Because you, you see... You know, I only see 20 breeds. You've probably seen 40 breeds, let alone all the mixed breeds. It is cooper- What we call cooperation is the, it's what the dog gives you naturally, almost without asking. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say cooperation is something which, I mean, there are slight variances. Um, I don't want to name the breeds because there are probably some beautiful, oh. uh, pretty you know, and it's not, you know, I've worked with, the, I haven't worked with many chow dogs, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but the couple that I did work were pretty um, standoffish. They just yep. didn't seem to want to, they weren't that kind of lovey-dovey. Right, is, right, hey. right. They're just like, oh, I'm a dog and I'm here. Almost like a cat. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of beautiful. I love it. But, but generally speaking, you know. The amount of deep connection you can have with almost dogs in any breed varies from one to a hundred. You know, I, for example, you know, Jack Russells, I don't know, they can be pretty, do their own thing, running around crazy. Well, there's a lady just because she's never had a dog before. She got a puppy. I took one look at this puppy. I thought that is the calmest, most connected, loyal puppy I've ever seen. Wow. And it just is. This is Jack Russell. You know, uh, uh, it's just incredible. It'll it- just lie there on a top bunk and just watch. And it's only like uh, probably six, seven months old. It doesn't try and jump off. It just lies there and then she'll pick it up and bring it down off the top bunk. And I'm like, what? A puppy just lay there watching for an hour and a half and didn't bark. And So that's so got to be some within every breed. Yeah. Huge connection and some that don't want to. Yeah. But so go back to Father Flanagan in Boys Town. There's got to be yeah. a few dogs out there that, you know, no fault of their own, just from how they got made, there's got to be a few of them out there that are just, I don't want to say hoodlums or thugs or or delinquents, but when you get that dog, let's just say, like, he's a bit of a delinquent, (laughs) okay? Yeah. Yeah. And so, going going back to humans, like, like somebody calls you up and says, oh, my dog, I can't get near him at the food bowl. Uh, When the the doorbell rings, I mean, he's going to tear the dog up. What, okay. What do you well, do then? With that sort of, so with that sort of stuff, you know, uh, you know, I don't know if you're happy for me to plug my program, but stuff yeah. like the food bowl and stuff like at the doorbell, if you put what I call the dog calming code in place, which is that deep connection with the dog, you'll find so much of that stuff disappears. Just, just goes away. So with, it goes away because, you know, the first part of the dog calming code talks about food and not understanding the power of food. Food is like money to the dogs. And if you don't understand when you're giving your dog the power and giving it away, and a lot of us don't, but we are in so much trouble. You can't come back from it. If With some dogs, 
let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. With some dogs I've met, if you leave food on the ground, it's game over. Mm. You know that free feeding, free feeding, whatever it's called. Yeah, I don't yeah. Want to call it. You know, he likes his food. He likes the grays. So we leave food on the ground for him. Well, I've, I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Yes, I have. <laughs> and, and it's not every dog. Some dogs you can leave food on the ground. And sure. They're fine. But there are some dogs, if you don't understand what you've done by sprinkling food or leaving a full bowl and keep topping it up. So there are some very, very powerful things you can do. And here's the thing around the, the doorbell, for example. When the dogs think that they're in charge, they become so protective around the front door. And it's, it's almost like if you came to my house, Ron, and the front doorbell rang, you probably wouldn't jump up and answer the door because it's my house. Right. And we know in my house, I'm in charge. Right. But if I came to your house and your doorbell rang, I probably wouldn't jump up and answer your door. You right. Would. You'd go to the door. It's your job to check it out and say to the person, come on in or go away. And so the reason we just know we don't need to is because we're not in charge and it's the same with the dog when the dogs think they're in charge it with some dogs it's impossible to stop them running up to the door and getting in front of you and trying to you know to make a decision on i'm going to bite you or come on in or go away or i'm going to jump on you but once you put what i call the dog calming code in place where you say to the dog you're not in charge then the doorbell rings then the dogs look at you and go well you say you're in charge you deal with it <laughs> All, That's like sounds like changes. my dad when the phone rang. He would say, "It's got to be for you guys. Somebody answered the phone. It's not. It's not for me." You're in, exactly. <laughs> and and so that's the beautiful thing about this method. When you understand the root cause of it, a lot of these issues disappear. Um, but your your question was, are there some dogs that you kind of can't transform? And you know the answer is yeah, there are some. But I would say they are far fewer than we actually realize. You know. Yeah. I, I wouldn't quite say one in a thousand dogs was almost just un, un, you know. unworkable or unteachable, but yeah. Yeah. but, there, but it, the, it'd be yeah, it's, it's around there. We could almost honestly, if it was really one in a thousand, we could just pretty much blame ourselves for our own dog's behavior. Then couldn't we? Well, you, you, we pretty much uh, yeah, you, it's, it's tough to blame the dog when it's <laughs> more like one in a thousand. But that's not to say that every dog can be a top champion. That's the thing. Right. And so it's kind of realizing, you know, you've got 10 dogs and um, three of them are uh, pretty darn good and three of them are okay and three of them just don't seem interested and that's how it is. And there's one, well, you don't want to talk about the 10th dog, you know. Or yeah, maybe no, the 10th nobody dog wants to talk about the, the neighbor's champion. kid who went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's, a, and that's exactly it. Yeah. You know, oh. it, it, so, it sounds so, you know, we sit there and talk about this. It almost sounds so simple, doesn't it? it, it I think we do overcomplicate it. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I think we do. We it, put all sorts of pressures on the dogs and timelines. And, you know, we're so into our fast, fast things, you know, immediate access to Netflix and fast food and. Amazon quick, and quick everything results. else. Yeah, we want it delivered tomorrow, and we want our dogs to be the top and the best. And it happens in school, you know. I met up with my mates the other day and have a drink, and God, they were all talking about how they're putting their kids, their sons, through this top training performance academy for soccer, and then moving schools because of this. And I'm getting them to do these five kilometers runs, and the child's only 12 years old. I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you? I mean, what are you doing? Your, right. your child is. Why are we doing this? You know, what it, whereas if we can enjoy the journey, I think a lot of the time our children and our dogs will love it so much more. Uh, that they'll actually become better at it. You know, just like my son with surfing. If I can make it a good experience and he enjoys it. Right. He'll, he'll pick it up maybe. He's, what is he, he's 11 now. He might not pick it up till he's 15 or 16. But then he goes, I used to do this for my dad and I love right. it. Right, you planted, the, you planted the seed, which is, goes back to foundation yeah. again. Yeah. Exactly. And then he takes it up at 16 or 26, maybe, and he turns into a, he loves his surf. Whereas I know if I push him too hard at this age, he can, he will never want to do surfing. He'll just have bad memories of it for uh, many years to come. <laughs> one you know. other thing I want to talk about was one of the things I wrote to you was, again, goes back to the testing of dogs. And, and that's in my, my passion. Um, mm. How do you know? 
you know, what might be too much for a particular dog. Uh, there, I, I, I want to, th- I, I go back to me like, okay, I was a, an average, average to low student, probably was never going to go to university. I didn't go to college, but I had a, I had a, I had a skill set. I just didn't know what that skill set was until it blossomed. But mm. how do you, how do you know if you're, or can you know if you're pushing the dog too much? Like, okay, this dog is not going to learn to sit up, play dead, pull your fi- trigger finger and lay down. I mean, how do you know, how do you read your dog if you're pushing it too hard? Or what's the sign? What do you, what do you look for? Like, it, it, it probably goes back to you didn't put the foundation under it. But how do you know if you're pushing your dog too far? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I I would come back to almost coming back to that gut instinct of, of you know, are, are you enjoying it? But more importantly, does the dog feel like they're enjoying it? Because yeah. if the dogs aren't enjoying it, you've got to ask your question, why are you even doing it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd even challenge your audience or, you know, I challenge myself. So am I doing this because I want to do this or my son wants to do this? Is is this good? Is this Is this my ego that I just want to have a son who's a great surfer or... Or is there more to it? And and then can I make it that it's fun for him and fun for my dogs? And and then, of course, if you can follow, because if you can follow the thing that your dog is actually good at, and this comes back to children, you know, your child might not be good at maths. They might not be good at geography or not very musical. But if they are actually a genius at art with the pen, that's where they're, you know, that's what they need to follow because that's their true genius. And it's like that with the dogs that they may not be good at the the sit down, roll over, back flip, fetch me a beer from the fridge. But if they can actually use their nose to detect and smell out truffles and they are actually the best truffle hunter in the world, then, hey, that's the thing you want to focus them on and forget all the other high five roly poly right. stuff. Just like the child who's amazing at fine art don't try and make them play the guitar. <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. They might be a good painter. It doesn't mean they're going to play drums. <laughs> exactly. And, and, you, and you're almost better off finding the one thing that your child or your dog is exceptional at and letting them be an, a, you know, a master in that area because that's their natural love and that's their natural gift than going, well, I want him to be great at everything. Right, <laughs> like, right. Know? And, you know, in, in the bird dog world, we sometimes, and I, I know people have made this mistake, they're, they're, the, the, the parents that they had breeding, you know, they'll have a title on them. Yeah. And, they get, and they get this dog. They're like, well, the dad was a master hunter and the mom was a versatile champion. Oh, this yeah. dog has to be a virtuoso in hunting. <laughs> you know? yep. It's like, nah, maybe not. Maybe not. Yep. You know. No, look. There was a kid on our street when I grew up, and his his, his um, father played for Newcastle United, which is a good football club in England, and he, he played. He played soccer. And this poor kid, you know, the pressure on him to perform was huge, but he, it wasn't really him. And, um, yeah, terrible pressure to put kids under, to put dogs under. And, you know... If they're not interested, you, uh, you know, it's hard to change that desire and that motivation. If a child really doesn't want to be a, a musician, it's hard to, to make them love music. Exactly, exactly. But, you know, to, to bring this back, you know, because this is the Hunting Dog podcast, we, assu- we assume we've yep. bought a hunting dog that, let's just say, for minimum of 100 years, their genetics, yep. their propensity is to hunt. But then we get one that acts like, okay. what are you doing? <laughs> you okay, know? okay. You know? Look, so I, I think maybe what I should add in here, which is make it fun. Make it fun. If you want to make sure your puppy, a new puppy hunting dog, enjoys hunting, don't focus on the point or the grabbing the bird. Just make anything to do with being out in the wild, being with other dogs, you know, fun. Yeah, and and start with the basic stuff of just saying whoa, whoa, and give the dog a treat. Right, come when called. You know, you know the basics. Come when called. Stay and stick on the basics, and your dog might not be able to do rolling. Your dog might not be able to do much, but if it can do the best whoa, and the best point, yeah. and the best come, and it just loves those three commands, 
hey, you're going to be happy. Yeah. And, and if the dog enjoys the experience and does it with other dogs, and yeah. D- One Dan- of the things my wife was a genius yep. as, as a mum is she made everything fun, you know, and it's kind of carried through. And we've just taken our children into um, homeschooling and um, we got them cleaning the cars, washing my cars, and I made it fun. <laughs> and they're, they're so happy. You're like it's Tom like- Sawyer. I'm going to have you paint the fence with me. Oh, no, painting the fence is fun. <laughs> I just thought this is hilarious. I, I said to my wife, look at this. This is homeschooling. And we've got the two kids both cleaning the two cars, and they're happy as can be because we made it fun. And I think that's the key to a lot of things. Well, and, I, I um, couldn't agree. Fine tune it later on. I could not yeah. agree more. Uh, it, it's almost like I don't want to knock you out of business or me out of business, but it's like if people could just kind of slow down and – Say, like, look, this is just another member of the family, and we just got to figure out what works. And the hard part is people have rose-colored glasses on. You know, Mm. they they don't see what they want to see, and they're like, oh, I got a problem. Well, you might not have a problem. (laughs) <laughs> you just, you just, you maybe went too fast, or you didn't introduce it properly. It goes back to your surfing with your son, or you know, hunting with a dog. Like, you just gotta let it mature a little bit. It's like wine; you gotta let it. it might need a couple more months, right? Take your time, exactly, exactly. And the other part I would throw in is enjoy, enjoy the journey, not just the destination. That. You know, so often we're so focused on thinking we're going to become happy when something happens. Yeah. When we stood on the podium with the gold medal going, you know, like, now I'm happy. Well, you might be happy for 10 minutes, and then you drive home and you get a puncture and you're sad again. <laughs> right. you know? So the more, the more you could realize you can actually be happy, you know, whether you get bronze medal or you can actually, you know, these people who kind of come last, but they're still happy. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's like. How can you be so happy? You came last. I, I came fourth, and I'm gutted. Well, that sounds like me. That is... sounds like me playing cards. I have. I'm one of these weird yeah. people that, if yeah. long as I'm playing cards with my friends, I don't care if I lose all night. <laughs> I, funny, I'm with yeah. my friends, and that kind of goes back to the pack thing. No, I'm with my pack. I don't. I don't care if I lose. Yeah, you happy. know. Yeah. But there, and there that's are more how nature is. There, there are dogs that are competitive. Like, so For sure. When when a dog, I, I've seen this happen a lot of times. You know, the dog does a real good job. He's he's getting his training, but then all of a sudden another dog comes into the picture. Oh yeah. And, and the dog all of a sudden it, it kind of goes back to like introducing the young dog to. But let's say we're introducing a a three year old dog. I don't care if it's in agility or in a show ring. All of a sudden another dog gets in there, and you see this competitive side. Is that just something we did wrong in the training, or is this just a dog thing that they're just like people, like like four guys, four mates going to the bar, and one of them going, "Look, I'm going to meet that girl and get her phone number. And I don't care what you guys say." You know, is there look, is is some of this out of our control, Dan? <laughs> oh, look, some of it is just like humans. You know, you, you know, some people, you know, when other people walk into the weights room, stuff, you know, they up their game. You yeah. might be the only person in the gym on your own and you've got no energy, you know, and then another person comes in. And some people might be more more motivated if it's a female. Some men yep. might be more motivated if it's another man walks in the gym. They're like, man, I'll, like, if you think you're strong, I'll show you what I lift. Right. And, um, and the dogs are no different, I believe, in many ways, that some dogs will respond. You know, some dogs might not respond at all to another dog in the area. Let me tell you a quick story because this blew me away when it happened. Um, and I think it sums up a lot of what we've discussed. I had um, an older dog. She was 13. She was a whippity pit bull, very loving girl. Um, she was called Inca. And she was so loving. And she was just a friendly, loving girl. And then I had these two male dogs who were aged um, about 9 and 10 years old. And every now and then they'd get into a bit of a tussle. They'd be nothing too major, but enough to kind of... They were always, you know, they are like a bit challenging each other the whole time. You know, they knew I was the boss, but they were, they, they kind of, you know. Flick, flexing their muscles a little bit. Flexing their flexing muscles. Their muscles. Yeah. And I kind of remember thinking, I wonder what will happen when dear Inca passes on, because he was going to die. And finally it happened, Inca passed over, and I remember thinking, gosh, 
she was kind of the love, you know, she was the loving, the female loving energy that was in that little group of three. Well, you know what happened? The boys settled down even more. Oh, wow. Now, she, she wasn't an aggressive girl, but there was something about having a female between the two of them that obviously created a little bit more tension. And I thought about it, and it took me by surprise, and then I thought about it, you know, if I had a good mate of mine, and we were kind of camping, and there was this one female <laughs> who was camping with us. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm you with know, you. <laughs> you're with me. I don't need to say too much, but there'd be a little bit of tension there about, you know, and, you know, every now and then I might be saying to the guy, you know, oh, you think you're this. You always try and do this, you know. You're always trying to impress a man. You're just annoying me. And then if she, if this lady upped and left and suddenly it was just me and my mate, I'm sure we would actually connect and go, you know what, brother? I love you, man. I love you too. Let's go. Let's go. And suddenly we're like brothers in arms and there's no, nothing to fight over. You know, was, I just thought, wow, is that... So I just share that because it took me by surprise, and yet it's no different from humans in many ways, you know? Yeah, and that goes back to where we started. It, it's like the puppies and the kids analogy. It really goes to yeah. dogs and adults. It's it's just... It's all energy. It, well, yeah, it's, energy. It's, it's all like, okay, that's cool. That's not cool. And <laughs> it, it, I've had friends, you know, when we were growing up as teenagers, oh, my God, we got in a fist fight, you know? Whether it was over a girl or whether it was over a, you know, you know, whatever it was. And then when something's taken out of the equation, you're like, eh, like what do you want to do tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and isn't that the same with humans as well? You know, we yeah. have sporting, we have rugby over here. And every now and then in the rugby match, there'll be a bit of a fist fight. And, you know, it looks like people are trying to kill each other. But at the end of, you know, 10 minutes later or at the end of the game, shaking hands and having a drink. Yeah. Same with the dogs. They have these fights and you think, man, they're going to hate each other forever more. But no, you know, they have these tussles and there's not really any damage or injury. And the next thing you know, they're playing quite happily often. So there's you know, a lot of similarities there. Yeah. A ton of similarities. But I will say there, there, I've noticed, you know, with some dogs I've had that yeah. for whatever reason... Yeah. There, there is like uh, my daughter has a, a Labrador that's three years old now, and I had a, a, a older dog. <clears throat> For some reason, those two butted heads, and may, you know it could have been the way Kelsey raised him, could have been the way my dog, uh, you know, acclimated to my pack of dogs. But for some reason, boy, they were button heads, just like yeah. w what you think is like, oh my God, why you're good dogs? Why aren't you getting along? You know. Um, yeah. W what do you do? And and I've had this happen to me. I had a I I had to get rid of probably. I, I did this on a podcast a couple weeks ago. Two of my favorite dogs were offsprings of my other dogs. W with a dog, at least in in my little you know microcosm of, of dog training, I've had dogs that like they could get along with a hundred other dogs, but they could see that same dog again. And game on, you know, is, is yes. that something that you just, is it just a management thing or can that be, can that be worked out? Because I've seen it. I just don't know if it's all from the nurture part or if it was from the nature part. Like those two dogs were like, you know, the, the you know, I don't know, like pick, pick two tribes in the world that have, you know, fought like the Hatfields and McCoys, as we say in America, were they just going to yeah. fight because they, they had to, or does it still go back to, you know, their, their, their rearing? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, I, I do find it easier sometimes to just to praise it and kind of frame everything by talking about humans. And, you know, I think about some guys who I've had arguments with and, I might not see them for three months, and then I see them, and I'm like, the same energy rises up in me. I'm like, mm -hmm. and um, does it mean it'll be there forever? Well, if you don't deal with it, it possibly can. It can get worse and worse and worse, even though you never see them. And, but you can also kind of create an experience where you have a good experience, and you kind of talk about it, and you go, yeah, okay, man, I, I hear where you're coming from. All good, brother. All good. Right. And it's over. Yeah. So you can do it. So I'd say kind of both is true. Um, I, I, I often say there's three stages almost, or there's a few stages. 
of making that happen. And the first one is, like I said, this dog calming code, this program of making sure the dog doesn't think they're in charge. It depowers them. It de-triggers them. Yeah. And they're just so much more tolerant. So that's the first thing. The next thing is setting up training, training situations, which is a bit like what we talked about where you make it easy for the dog not to get it wrong. So rather than sticking the two dogs face to face, you might just create some fun experiences where they can see each other, but they're not in such a personal space. Right. And that's the second thing, the training aspect. The third aspect, which is often overlooked, is often the energetics of things that are energy, creating a positive, happy, relaxed energy. It can have a big impact as well. It almost sounds too easy, Dan. <laughs> it almost sounds too easy, you know? I mean... Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not saying it is easy, but it is certainly a lot easier than a lot of dog training methods make out, I would say. Right. There's right. a lot of smoke and mirrors. I'll be honest, I'd say there's a lot of smoke and mirrors with dog training. What, that, you what? know, like my program, it's $1 for three days and a lot of people they do it they try it and they go man i've solved my problem and they cancel before the 37 dollars a month starts <laughs> i'm fine <laughs> that's Just, it you you've I'm happy you've, I don't care you you've helped them and they got what they needed to get and yeah and they tell other people it works and use it and um that's kind of how it rolls but you know, sometimes, you know, I saw an advert, and I'm not knocking this, but it, I had to laugh. I saw an advert on Facebook of somebody saying, I'll train your dog. Are you struggling with a recall? You know, come and do my week's training, and I'll, you know, for one and a half thousand dollars. I was like, one and a half thousand dollars for a recall? I mean, 90, 99% of dogs, I can get that in 20 minutes. If you know what you're doing, it's, it's, a, it's a half hour job. It's, it's not rocket science when you know how to do it. But no, it can't be rocket science because so it was it was started, you know, 200,000 <laughs> years ago, right? There was no rockets. <laughs> There's no rockets. I mean, all you got, I often say this, you know, dogs love running. Most dogs love running. Mm -hmm. And most dogs love eating peanut butter, cheese, meat, bacon. Yep. So if you can explain to a dog, hey, when I blow this whistle, if you come running, I'll give you cheese, bacon, and peanut butter. Dog's going to be like, are you serious? Yep. And, and you don't even have to rely on the food every time. You just start with the food every time. Dog goes, got it. So you blow the whistle and I come and you give me that? Yep. It's a deal. Once you can communicate, that's the contract. And you sign the contract and the dog signs the contract. And the key thing is often with this is not to put the dog on the lead when it comes. So you say to the dog, you come running and I'll let you go again. Right. And that's making it as easy as you possibly can for the dog so that it gets a positive and a positive and there's no downside. You start there and before you know it, the dog whistle. I love it when you blow the whistle. You know, that that resonates with me. I did a, a, a about four years ago, there's a, a pretty famous dog trainer in the States called George Hickok. And yeah. he says dogs work for a paycheck. Yes. And that's what you just said made me think like, yeah, yeah it's a paycheck. Yeah. And, like, that's how we all get our first job. We're like, oh, my God, I got money. Yeah. Of course I'm yeah. going to show up tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning because I'm yeah. going to get more money, you know. And, and, and for, here's the thing. And here's the thing with the paycheck is realizing that peanut butter, bacon, and cheese <laughs> is like $10,000. Right. And one dry piece of kibble where they've already eaten a whole bowl full already and they're full. That's like 10 cents. Right. Right. So just you, you. It's kind of like you're, you're giving them the uh, the best tasting ice cream, but you're yeah, and they and, and they, they just, only get it when they do something really good. When they do something really good. Because <laughs> my other analogy is, you know, it's no good giving you. If I say to my son at the beginning of every week, "Here, son, here's um, here's twenty dollars," just because you get twenty dollars pocket money for doing absolutely nothing. It's just Monday, and I just give you 20 bucks. If I didn't say to him, will you wash my car for four or five bucks? He'd be like, nah, not today. Thanks, Dad. I've already got 20. <laughs> i already got 20. <laughs> but if he gets no pocket money, and I, I, I've only, only just realized this now, they get pocket money, but they don't get it for doing nothing. They have to get these little you know, chalk marks on the board, emptying the bins, um, stacking the dishwasher, you know, going around feeding the dogs washing the dog's bowls out. So they click up as many as they want, and that's how they get the money. So it's the same principle. 
And yet a lot of us, we feed our dogs so much food in the morning, the dog's full, it's not hungry, and then we take some of the same dry kibble and expect the dog to work for it. Right. The dog looks at it and goes, nah, you get, you gotta, no, not really. We have to up the ante yeah. a little bit when it comes to reward. But the, exactly. the dogs yeah. respond to that, just like kids do. It's like Halloween, you know, in the, in the States. Yeah. Do they have Halloween in, in New Zealand? Like the kids yeah. running around with a bag yeah. of candy and trying to get, you know. Oh, just, we go around with wheelbarrows and wheelbarrows full of candy. Sometimes <laughs> it's getting ridiculous. It's, yeah. yeah. We, we walked down our street the other day and there was a lady hidden in a freezer. And it said, open the door. And as we opened the lid of the freezer, which was out the front of a house, she sat up with a witch's hat on, terrified us all. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Halloween yeah well Dan I, I you know I, I think what we need to do is next time I do this I'm going to put listeners because you know no matter what we say someone's going yep. to write me and say well, I've done this right but my dog's doing this so I'm going to put this question to my audience and yes. see if I can accumulate let's say 10 or 15 situations I'm going to yes. guess that most of it's going to go back to foundation and most of it's going to go yeah. back to what we've talked about. But I'd yeah. like to give them the opportunity to ask you specific questions like uh, on their dog's behavior. And I, I think that'd be a fun one to do. Totally. Love to come back, Ron. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Dan, how do people, how do people get a hold of you? Like, what's the best way? I know you said it early on, but let's, let's get that you know, clear here. Yeah, well, it'd probably be good for you to repeat it because I've got my interesting accent from... Uh, well, yeah. I'm English and live in New Zealand, but it's The Online Dog Trainer. So it's like T-H-E, The, The Online Dog Trainer.com. And that works with... I mean, you've done people... You've done phone consultations. You've been flown to other countries. What's... It, it, I, I mean, that, I I hate asking this at the end of a podcast because I probably should have yes. I should have tooled this up earlier. That's all good. Some of the uh, uh, maybe one or two stories of like the person who said, "Can you help me?" And it was just like, <laughs> you almost don't even need help, but you something you did with them that was just like the aha moment. Like, oh my god, I didn't realize that. I mean, there's got to be a couple yeah. stories where you're just like, my God, they didn't even need to call me. <laughs> uh, look, I mean, the, the one, probably one example is I went and worked with a lovely man who had a dog who kept running outside and barking up and down the fence. And as the dog was barking, he'd sort of say, you know, he's, he's a real smart dog. He's a real smart dog. And he'd be shouting, you know, what is his name? Rufus, Rufus, come here. Rufus, come here. And, um, and the dog would have totally ignore him. And he'd shout, Rufus, come. Rufus, come. Rufus, come. After, you know, 30 seconds, Rufus had kind of come running over, at which point he'd pat the dog on the head and give Rufus a cookie. Mm -hmm. And he'd look at me and he goes, he's a real smart dog. <laughs> and I looked at him and I thought, are you serious? The dog ignored you. The dog ignored you. The dog ignored you. The dog barked at the stranger, barked at the stranger. And then when the dog wanted to do on his terms, after he protected the property and the person had gone away, then the dog came over and you rewarded him for protecting the property. That's how I saw it. <laughs> that makes... And that's how the dog saw it, I'm sure. Sure. The, the dog... dog got the reward for barking at the fence and then coming over and he got his treat for protecting the property and chasing the people away. And then he's like, so, hey, once I get done doing that, then I come back to my owner. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had the fun of the bark and the scaring the people, and I got the treat, and I got the pets. What, did, so you, what that, did you do with yeah. Rufus? What did you do with that dog? Well, so that was where, before you even go out into the garden, you know, there's three stages, which, you know, I go through in the Dog Calming Code, which surround food and how you interact with the dog and connect with the dog and give your pets and cuddles and that sort of stuff. Once you've done that, the dog is far more focused than listening to you. And so one of the things you can do once the dogs are barking is rather than raising your voice and shouting, you you kind of, it's, it may sound a bit weird, and this is why I love videos, because when I try and explain it on a phone in you yeah. know, 30 seconds, it's very hard. But you actually just acknowledge the dog, and then you walk over to where the dog is, have a look, and say thank you and walk away again. And the dog will feel your energy is not all excited. And by having a look, the dog knows you've checked it out. 
and oh, the dog so, will be spark karma, and the dog gets no reward. Yeah. So the dog, you, you, the dog kind of brought you into his pack, kind of like. Or well, you, what it is is what tends to happen is we sit there like this fella did, shouting, "Knock it off, shut up!" And the dog just hears <laughs> us barking, and the dog gets more aggressive. And right, you know, it's almost like it just amps. We we amp the dog up, and the dog gets more excited, and then it gets a reward, or it just ends up excited, thinking it's done its job. This approach is actually recognizing the dog is just alerting us to something, and then more kind of just to kind of go, "Oh, don't worry about it." <laughs> and if the dog carries on. You go and have a look, and you put them in timeout if they carried on a little bit more. Now, it might sound like that's going to be a lot of work, but if you do that for two or three times or two or three days, and then the dog just doesn't stops barking, I mean, most of your listeners are probably thinking, what are you talking about? But when you see it on video, you realize the dogs are just energy going, we got a problem, rah, 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 rah. and we shout, knock it off, shut up, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> but if you say, don't worry about it, and the dog says, no, seriously, come and have a look. There's a little old lady over there with a fluffy white dog. And you go and have a look and you go, ah, don't worry about it. And walk away. The dogs feel it. They feel the energy. They feel the energy. You've checked it out and said, don't worry. And, yeah. Dan, you might put yourself out of business because it sounds too easy. <laughs> Well, like I say, a lot of people do do the trial and kind of go and solve the problem. But right. there's enough people who love the program so much they stay on. And right. obviously, you know, like anything, there's the uh, there's the surface, and then there's the going deep. And um, yeah, yeah, and I'm sure you have a, a lot more problems than just that. You know, just you know the the barking. Yeah. I, I have a perfect example of Taffy, my my English cocker. Yeah. She she will hear literally my my. Kennel is about 300 feet from my back door, maybe 250 yeah. feet. She hears the door open, and she starts barking. And yeah. I, I have said to her, like, Taffy, quiet. And it just ra it ramps <laughs> her up. It ramps her up, right? Yeah. And, of course, yeah. they learn by association. So by the time I walk 250 feet and open the kennels up, Taffy thinks, that worked. <laughs> you know? Yes. So yes. what would I do with Taffy? Okay. I, I know this yeah. is almost an impossible last question, yeah. Dan. So yeah. I'm walking out the door. All my other dogs, they're just like, eh, he'll be here when he gets here. For some yeah. reason, she just learned that, like, if I bark, that's the only reason. I'm coming here no matter what. I'm coming here every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning to open up the kennels. But that dog, that dog just like, if I bark like a ninny. <laughs> he's going to let me out. And I'm like, no, Taffy, I'm going to let you out no matter what, right? Do, yeah. Should I should I turn away and walk back into the house till she quits? or Because well, this, this dog, yeah. I love her to death. The only thing I don't like about her is she has, I'm sure it's from me, but then part of me thinks like, well, no, I mean, I have to walk 250 feet. She's barking the entire time. She quits barking once I open up the kennel. So should I not open up the kennel for her? Should I not reward her? What am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. So let me boil it down, and then I'll kind of come up with some ideas. And and this is where working in person is slightly easier because I can try some. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but in theory, as you're probably aware, the reward for her is getting out. Exactly. I'm yeah. 99% sure that's it. So... The reward is almost going to be, when you're quiet, I'll let you out. And to start with, I would say that you really just needed to be quiet for maybe, you know, two seconds, three seconds. You know, if she's one of these dogs that's literally going, row, 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 bark, 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 right, bark, right. bark, 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 bark. If she stops, three, four, five seconds, you might open the door and let her out. And then the next time you can build it up. So that's one area of how you can make it. You, it might not seem like much to start with, but if you were to stand, and here's how you'd get it to stop barking. You could walk right up to the cage gate and stand there and turn your back on her. That might do it. Or you might move two or three steps away. Now, if you started walking away, this actually comes down to how smart she is. No offense, but yeah. some very, very smart dogs work this stuff out. It's not the only test, but it's one test of intelligence, I think. Some dogs have done this, where you walk towards the gate, and they're barking, barking. Now, if you stop and turn away, 
they realize that the thing that they were doing is not getting the result they want. Oh, so they instantly I like change. That. I like that. Yeah. Some dogs literally go, hang on, I was barking and he was walking towards me. Now he's walking away. What happens if I stop? So they stop. Now, if she stops, what I would do is I'd turn and walk back towards her, almost going, yes, I'm rewarding you. <clears throat> and some dogs are literally that quick. And that's where, like I've written in my book, dog, humans are not logical. Some dogs <laughs> are so quick and so logical that if you can realize that's how their logic is working, you can, they're like, okay, I've stopped barking. And then the next time it gets easier. But some dogs will be more a case of you might want to take your beer and, you know, some nuts and picnic and actually <laughs> camp out 10 or 20 yards from the gate and sit down and just start studying the grass, lie on your belly and study the grass, drink your beer and literally go, I'm going to lie here until you shut up. The second they stop barking, I'd stand up and start walking towards her. Chances are she'll start barking, in which case you turn around or just sit down and start looking at the grass again. And, you know, it may take a little bit of time before she gets it, but once they get it, as long as you reinforce it, you know, you, um, you, you're on to a winner. So, you, again, it, it, goes to, it goes to rewarding the behavior you're looking for. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I can tell you that when she got here, she probably she was not a barker, but for yes. whatever reason, she started this. I have literally, from the, the door of my back, the, the, the back door of my house, She'll start, I mean, I swear to God, this dog listens to the door handle, right? She, yeah. She's just so, so, so focused on, like, he's coming, he's coming. And here's the other thing. <laughs> You've got to somehow desensitize that door handle, door opening, and the walk from your house to the kennel. So you can sometimes do that by actually doing that process and that exercise when she's not so stimulated because maybe she's already had a run. Yeah. So if yeah. you take her for a walk or a run and then you put her in the crate and then you go over to the door, come out the door, do the door handle, walk over, she's not excited as much because she's like, well, he's not going to open the door. Yeah. But you walk right up to the kennel and she's yeah. maybe not barking and you let her out. And then at least she goes, oh, that was funny. He walked right up to my kennel. I wasn't even barking and he let me out. So <laughs> maybe it's not the barking that gets him to open the door. Oh. Because in, in her mind... She's probably barking. I'm making this up a little bit, but it's probably tr based on truth. She's probably barking, going, "Quick, run, get over here, and oh, open the gate." Quick, that's that's the exactly gate. the way oh. I feel, Dan. She's like, "Yeah, hurry, it, hurry, it, hurry, hurry, push. hurry." Yeah. And, and yeah. of course, what and, do I do? So I, I, I yell at her as I'm walking yeah. there. And of course, the yelling doesn't mean nothing to her. And then I come into yeah. kennel. I let all five dogs out, and she's like, "That worked." That worked really well. <laughs> oh, you got to laugh, eh? I know. I know. I, it's so funny because I, the, the other dogs I've had, I, I, it, she was raised in the kennel and in the house and both. But for some reason, she has just learned to, like, push my buttons. <laughs> and, like, it's so loud. I don't want this. And I've, I've yeah. literally given her exactly what she wants, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it go, and the hardest thing is sometimes just breaking that cycle to start with. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to yeah. take some of that doggy Dan advice and work on Taffy's yeah. because everything else I love about this dog, and and I, I will say this, uh, you know, you're you're from the UK originally, right? And yes. I, yes. I, you know, it's, it, the English cocker, this is a what we call a field-bred English cocker spaniel. So there's cocker Lovely. spaniels out there that are show dogs and hunting dogs. But the field-bred English cocker, I, I've never had a dog like this, this connected to me. I mean, uh, it, it's, she stares me in the eyes, Dan. Like when Focus. she sits there and looks at me in the eyes, and it, maybe we'll wrap it up with this. Now, I've met people who have had, literally told me one time, this is a friend of mine in Pennsylvania, don't stare my dog in the eyes because he gets uncomfortable. Now, maybe that's something from nurture and nature and genetics, but this dog loves to make eye contact. I mean, like, almost like creepy. <laughs> like, I will have her on the road in my house in Virginia, you know, all the dogs sleep on a bed. In my house here, they all sleep in the kennel. So they, they get a nice mix. This dog, I literally think she can hear my eyelids open. <laughs> because I, 
I open my eyes, and there she is staring at me. Is, is there mm-hmm. any? I, I, this could just be all anthropomorphication on Ron's part. Is there dogs that have a certain, like, connection that just, like, because if, if, when I go back to aggressive dogs, you know, once a, you know, a dog can kind of sniff and bump around and look around and, and posture and tiptoe, but then if it's, if it's two dogs that don't get along, boy, if they stare at each other, it, it could be a fight, right? What yeah. makes, what makes, it, what makes some dogs look you in the eyes and other dogs they kind of look in the eyes uh, but they kind of look away a little bit you know is there oh, yeah. am i am i making well, this up or is this real well you know as i understand it, anthropomorphism is kind of attaching human mm-hmm. um emotions to animals or to dogs you right know? right and i'm 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 all for anthropomorphism let's get this clear yeah i'm 100% on board with anthropomorphism let's attach those 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 um, emotions, and I've chatted to a few other people who said totally, because otherwise what we're doing is we're kind of trying to claim that the human being owns happiness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you joking? I mean, we don't own happiness. There's happy <laughs> dogs out there, and there's happy humans, and and so all we're doing is I'm just saying that just because we have we can be happy and sad and fearful and confident, I will. I will always attach the same emotions to dogs. Now, I might not always get it right, but there's nothing wrong, in my opinion, with anthropomorphizing. Of course, you can get it wrong. Sure. And uh, you get completely wrong. But that is what I'm doing, and that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's, so, because w- in the same way, because that's pretty much what we've been talking about the whole time, anthropomorphizing, saying that dogs are feeling this energy, and they have their same energy. So... I believe it's very similar to being like a human where, you know, there's certain, there's certain people I would not stare in the eyes. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. <laughs> because you're likely to get punched in the face. Very quickly. <laughs> right, right. And then there's certain people who, if I look them in the eyes, they might look away because they feel threatened or they might think I'm weird. Right. And then there's other people who might try and look me in the eyes or catch my eye and it might be very attractive and, a beautiful thing right right <laughs> and there's everything in between and the dogs are the same and some people are more confident and happy and relaxed staring and looking at people they're right. wide-eyed they're looking around you see it at the supermarket you know people who are looking at people and maybe not but more more likely at the supermarket people aren't looking at each other right but then there's other places so it's just the full variety so you really have to kind of Take every dog, every human, every situation in its unique place. And usually those people and those dogs that are looking in your eyes are, if it's a calm energy, they are good at reading you, good at connecting. And so I think the question was, will she get in trouble if she looks the wrong dog in the eyes? But the chances are, if she's one of those wide-eyed kind of dogs that loves connecting, then she'll know when not to look at, you know, another dog in the eyes. Yeah. She'll know. Well, I'll tell you what. People who are good with people know not to try and stare people out. Yeah. You could could walk into a convenience store and open the door for somebody and they're like, thank you. And the other one's like, they just walk past you like, geez, I just opened the door for you. (laughs) (laughs) So it was nature or nurture. (laughs) There we go. It's like this whole thing. There's like, there's no answer to this, you know? It's like, oh my God, I got to put this. I got to put this thought yeah. process into every dog and every human I come in. And it's the yeah, only, yeah. I, I have to say, I, I, I've never been around lions or cheetahs or, or, yeah. or bears, but I, I'm assuming it's because for the, people say for 20,000 years, we've been cohabitating with canines. Like they yes. really are just another, I know it sounds goofy, but they're just another kind of person, aren't they? They, they've got so much ability to read us. I think that's the yeah. thing. Because they don't have probably, the language, so it's no. all in their instincts. It's all in their yeah. their eyes yeah. and their nose and... and They're feeling it, yeah. They feel it. And, and I think they, they read us, you see, probably better than we read them. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> Which, and that's why the energy is so important, because when we're feeling frustrated or angry or stressed... 
we might not think we're giving off that energy or message, but they're picking it up. So right. we need to be aware of how we're feeling. I because, would tell people that if you're yeah. training a dog, the best thing you do is be married for 35 years like me. And you, you, you pick that up pretty quick after you've been married 35 <laughs> years. But yeah. to the new dog owner who's only 30, well, you know, you're, you're kind of asking a lot of him because he's got to learn a lot in a short period of time, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Well, Dan, um, um, this, this, is, this is one of the – well, I wouldn't say it's the longest podcast, but uh, – this has been this has been fantastic. This has been it's fantastic. Been a good one. Yeah, um, and, I agree. and and I think if we take anything away from it, it's like go slow, figure out your your place, let the dog know that like you, w- without being demonstrative, just let the dog know who's in charge and and then work with it from there. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you're struggling with the how do you show the dog who's in charge and you don't want to be shouting and right. smacking the dog, and then go to my website, theonlinedogtrainer.com. Is that, does that make sense how I've said it, Ron? I know sometimes my accent's a bit funny. Is it the, do you say the online dog trainer? Yeah. Dot com? Yeah, That's the fun. or the, but it doesn't matter. The. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. I will tell you that yeah. there will be a lot of people that will be like, hmm. I wonder, I wonder if it can fix my – it might be a steadiness question or it might be a retrieving question, but I think the answers can come from someone who says, like, it's more like take a step back. Yeah. It's not that hard to do. You just got to – No. You got to take a step back and go like, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Um, and when yeah. we go to – when we you know, in, in the beginning we talked about, you know, the the – similarities between children or whatever age children and dogs i go kind of back to the my my kids all three of my daughters have had kids now you know all young very young yes and they've kind of relied on their mom for what to do right <laughs> because it, yeah. it worked right and so when you get into the dog world you know go to people who have been there you know, the worst thing you can do is you know, is 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 has a, have a new child with a new husband and be in a bubble. So, you know, go to someone yeah. who can like just talk your language and and say, okay, here's what you got to do: slow down, or yeah. do this, or do that. Yeah. Um, set the parameters, and this is not ro- like you said earlier. It's not rocket science. <laughs> they've they've no, been they've been no. around for we've been doing this for twenty thousand years with dogs, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, and and if anyone's got a puppy, one of the programs I put inside my um the inside the online dog train is called Project Moses, and I literally videoed my puppy from about ten weeks of age, or maybe he was eight weeks, right through to eight months. Oh, and that'd be great. The very first time I saw him and I picked him up and the first time he met my children and the first time we took him out for the toilet, walking him on, I videoed it and you can see his progression right through from eight weeks to eight months. So if anybody's struggling with that sort of thing, it's quite fascinating because you can see the development and he's a good boy now. You know, he's 10 years old now, so it's all in there. Oh, that's, you know, and that's what people need to see because the, you yeah. feel like in a way like, taken away from being a first-time parent, but there's a whole lot more first-time dog owners, and they're intimidated yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And to yep. see that and, in, a, in a chronological yeah. order, like, oh, oh, I'm there, or I'm there. Yeah. I can see what, I can yeah. see what that would. So one more plug. Let's, how do people find you again? <laughs> yeah, it's the, on, the online dog trainer.com. That's it. Very simple. And this doesn't That's matter it. if you have a Lhasa Apsu or a German Shepherd or a German Short Hair. Just. No. Yeah, that's exactly it. I think maybe 60,000 people have used the program and thousands and thousands of happy reviews. And, yeah, it really does. It's a powerful approach and uh, can work a lot quicker than people realize, which is what I love about the program. Yeah, yeah it's almost kind of mm. like the uh, the. Uh, 
like when you get computer 101 for dummies or, you know, MacBook Pro for dummies, it's like, oh, this isn't that hard. I just need a little, I just need yeah. a little, I just need a little help. Yeah, and, that's and, exactly it. And I'm, yeah. sh- I'm sure they'll see like, oh, this isn't, I don't have to have a degree from MIT to train my dog. I just need a little structure. That's exactly right. There's some real powerful dog shortcuts if we're, if we're open to learning some little shortcuts, it, it can be so much more enjoyable and quicker and, and less effort, you know. You don't have to spend hours and hours and hours training your dog sometimes. When you get the basics right, it right. changes. Yeah. It all goes to the foundation, you know. Yeah. Now, yeah. real quick, yeah. if somebody just got their – and this happens here in the States. I don't know if it happens in New Zealand. But there is a yeah. real big – I don't want to say propensity um, – Especially during COVID, they're all of a sudden some said, "You know what? We need we need a dog," and they go to the the animal welfare or the the county pound, and they get a dog that they don't know that it might be five years old or three years old. Or is is that something you can still help them with, just to get them to oh, yeah. read yes. the dog and and not be because people will take the leap, just like buying a car. You buy this car, and you're like, I, I really don't know how the engine works. You know, could they buy that older dog and still get some value? 100%. 100%. I would even go so far as to say, you know, some of those dogs, the older dogs, because of what we just talked about, that we, we think that's – I'm not saying we think that's stupid, but, you know, we sometimes don't – we don't give them credit for what they can actually feel. And I've yeah. got no doubt that some of those older dogs who've been, they've had a tough life. I mean, think of it. Right. You know, probably right. they've, they've had a tough life. They've been stressed. They've maybe barked because they were left alone, were hungry. They went prowling and got, got um, picked up by the, the rescue center and kicked out and a bit abused maybe and neglected. And, well, can you imagine what happens when some kind person says, hmm, do you think this is a nice dog? Yeah. And takes them home and treats them well. Yeah. Do you know how much love that sort of a dog can have for you? It is off the charts. These are, these are dogs that have never been truly loved or cared for. Yeah. Never mind given a three square meals a day or two square meals a day and, and cuddled and lay in front of the fire. So the love and the, the, the commitment that they can give is sometimes it's off the charts compared to even maybe a young pup who's never known anything else other than being a little bit spoiled and treated like a little princess. princess. <laughs> well, well, there's always that. <laughs> well, but You know what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. Some of these little puppies, they just don't know how good they've got it because they've never had it rough. Right. But those older dogs who are calm and they just want to be given a chance in life before they're put down, to put to sleep or die. Yeah. When you give them a chance, they are your dog for life. And, and I know because I've met thousands of them. People who said, I got him from the pound, got him from the rescue. Best dog I ever had. Oh, that's... Best dog I ever had. I had all these other dogs, pedigree dogs, and then I found this one on the street. And, and... That, and that, dog can, that dog can feel that, can't they? They, they yep. just like, oh, my God, you know, I might have been bounced. It's almost like a kid. I might have been bounced around from foster yep. home to foster home. Yep. yep. Oh, my God, this person loves me, you know. And yeah. It, yeah. There was a fellow a fella I interviewed yeah. a few years ago, and his yeah. wife worked at a rescue. And when, a let's say, an English setter or a German short hair would come in, he would take it into his pack. Yes. And he was like, the dogs I've got from rescue are the best dogs I've ever owned. Uh. <laughs> and, and there's another guy, and I'm, I, I could almost tear up. There's another yeah. person I interviewed from Texas who worked with a German short hair rescue uh, outfit. And she had an older, uh, let's just say older gentleman that lived in the area. And there was some dogs that, you know, and, you know pe- dogs get to 10, 12 years old and people just un- sadly or unfortunately or terribly, they're like, no, I, I can't keep the dog anymore. He's, he's, he's just, he's not hunting anymore. And this guy, his job is to take an old dog and take him till his end. Oh, uh, and, wow. And could you imagine being that old hunting dog or that old herding dog? Yeah. And saying, oh, my God, I'm at Grandma's house. 
Grandma's baking cookies for me, and I'm going to live out my days? Oh, my God. I, I, at some point, I don't know when I'm going to quit hunting, but at some point, I want to be that guy that says, you know what? Bring me your old. Bring me your old dog. Let him stay here uh, for a year uh, or two, you know? And I, and yeah. I know those dogs were, would, what you're saying, those dogs can respond to that, uh, that affection and that they're like, oh, I'm home. I'm finally home, you know? Yeah, totally, totally. I had the same thought process about having a sanctuary for all the dogs. What a beautiful thing. And they just chilled out, lying around, yep. happy, grateful. Yeah. I'll start that in about 10 years unless I get decrepit older <laughs> sooner than that. But <laughs> I, 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 could, I could see five old dogs laying around here by my wood stove saying, oh, thank you. Just thank you. Thank you, Ron. You know? <laughs> yeah. Ron, when the role's reversed, we'll look after you. That's uh, I would appreciate it, Dan. <laughs> if, yeah. Even if I got to fly to New Zealand and you and your wife have to take care of me. <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, it's beautiful. Beautiful. Dan, let's, let's make this a regular. I'm going to put some questions out to my uh, listeners, and I'm sure a lot of them will be answered with the basics, but I think it would be fun to you know, get into some specific behavior things. Again, you know, you're working on the phone or on an email, but I think it would be good to get those, uh, I don't want you want to call it problem solving issues, but I am sure there's people that would be like, oh, I'd love to hear Dan ask me, you know, answer that question. And, and again, the, good. the answers are going to be pretty typical, but sometimes people just need to hear the answer and like, oh, I get it finally. Yeah, 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 sounds good. Sounds good. Let's do it. Okay, bud. We'll talk to you now. It's uh, of, now. Do you have Thanksgiving in New Zealand, or is that just in the states? <laughs> That's just in the states. That's, That's what I thought. Mythical, That's what I thought. Be- mythical kind of Thanksgiving's one of those myth- mythical things that we only see on the movies. So, okay, so you know. it is. Uh, it's Wednesday, the night before Thanksgiving. You are already in the Thursday, and I can't thank you enough for coming on what I would thought would have been a little intrusion on your holiday, but uh, I'm glad it's just another Thursday for you. It's just another Thursday, the 25th of November over here. <laughs> and it's the 24th back home. Isn't that funny? Beautiful, Ron. Well, it's, great. it's been great chatting to you. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Oh, this has been great. Thanks, Dan. Have a good one. Take All care. Right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Well, I hope some of that resonated with everybody. It really resonated with me. <clears throat> and I also want to thank my Patreon patrons, Pike Gear, Onyx, CZ USA, Boss Shot Shells, Waltons, Purina, Gunner Kennels, Garmin, K9 Athlete, W Hunting Supply, Deck Drawer Systems. And I want to thank you guys for listening. And you girls, of course, girls should come first. I don't know why I say guys. It's like a habit. I always say guys first. It's wrong. Girls first. I still open the door. Talk to you next week.